All right. So the topic is pond breaks. So what do you guys think uh, when I say pond breaks? When um, when the center more or less is uh, filled with ponds from both sides and you're trying to figure out how to, how or when to capture a, to like break through, to capture an opposing pond and move your own pieces and or ponds through to their territory. Right, and, and it's necessitated, as you said, by this closed center. So the center's closed, we'll generally want to, you know, begin by attacking in the center. So let's say someone does attack in the center, they strike with like, you know, like a king's in with e5, and then let's say white chooses to bypass. So you close, the position becomes closed after a clash. They can obviously choose to trade and open it or keep the tension. So tension is broken, right? No more tension bypass. And then it's like, okay, well, if I can't do anything in the center, I'd probably go for wing play. So generally speaking, the pawn break would be on the wings uh, when the center gets closed up. It doesn't have to be, but that's like like your typical. So just to show like the type of, just to make it concrete, like there, there's a break, right? Very common break. We've all seen the French probably. We've looked at this in some classes. So your break is C5 because the center immediately gets locked out. This early, I don't know if I'd recommend for white to go immediately E5. Usually, actually, Jordan, you mentioned this once. There is a line or two where you could do that, but usually they go like 93 or 92 or something. But yeah, it's immediately closed and we get a break. There's actually another break, just since we're on this. What's the other break that um, Black can do in, in a closed French position? F6. F6, exactly. So we call that attacking the which part of the pawn chain? Um, Versus the base, called base. Attack the base. That's ideal. You, the Nimzovich talks about attack the pawn chain at the base because that's. Um, you know, then, then the thing is going to start collapsing like dominoes. That's the weakest point, right? You want to make it more accessible. So for example, in the French, well, this would be kind of the base here. So sometimes they'll bypass and they'll go for this. That's pretty slow. But technically, I mean, that becomes like the base, right? When you trade it ultimately, well, he does trade soon enough, right? That becomes like a little pawn chain. Now we have a clear attackable point. So you can see just immediately, you can already see the benefits of getting your break in. If you don't do it, white's just going to do whatever they want. First of all, you create counterplay. White has space. They've squeezed you with E5. You got the pawn wedge, right? Thorning your side kind of thing, or right in the middle, right in your belly, I guess. Um, but yeah, so you're striking C5. You're opening up the C file soon. You're creating attacking chances on D4. Keep in mind, if you just bring your knight in front, that's kind of dubious, because then you give up your chance to make your break for a while, right? It's kind of like Hobava. Someone was talking about the Jobava London. It's like, it's not terrible, but you do, when you bring the knight in front of the pawn, you do take away those possibilities to move your C pawn, which is, which is consequential. And it's possible, but it's classic chess game, breaking at your knight behind. Queen is, looks, hey, it comes out early, but it's fine. No one's bothering the queen. She's putting pressure on B2, D4. And uh, we, can, we can then develop our knight through H6 or uh, via E7 to F5. And we just pile up on that thing. Bishop's bad, we'll get the bishop out eventually. But yeah, so we have a target, we have freedom of our pieces. And again, when it's closed up, you just don't really have freedom of movement, especially the rooks. I mean, the rooks are not going to get out unless you open lines, unless you do like the kind of apparently amateurish h5, rook h6. Well, the, it'll get taken by the bishop. But you know, sometimes you can do that. But generally speaking, we make our break and we come in through uh, open files, right? Or half open files. So yeah, of course, there are exceptions. So that's the idea, right? And then, as you can see, we just talked about Anand. So we have him doing a cool one in the French. So we have uh, actually we have four French games because the French is just a classic example of pawn breaks. No, wait, is that five? There are five French games. I just really like this. And then we have four Kings Indians. So pretty much, I mean, I just think those are really useful demonstrations of pawn breaks. So that's four, right? Going up to number nine. And then after that, kind of mixing it up a little bit just to show the complexity. I mean, obviously you're not always just gonna have those types of structures. Um, you might have uh, certain versions like Benoni's and things I call it hybrid, hybrid warfare. So it's like semi-open, not totally locked, but you still make your breaks. Or let's think of, a, uh, for example, a Botvinnik system um, where white has the pawns on D3, C4 and E4. Well, you can break in both ways. Right. Maybe you go for an F4 break. Maybe oh, so let's say black has something. Maybe even black does that too. We can go for breaks on the wings. Again, if you know they're you have a stone wall. I mean, I may as well. I could just make it real quick, add a new chapter. So for example, let's say we're going with uh, like C4. Oh, uh, you can go, we can go C5. 
and then something you know just to show you how it might get there right yeah usually if you're on keto bishops and let's just say that black decides you know you, you don't nearly i kind of like that i like great snake type setup with e6 actually you can see that e6 is already scoring better for black keep that in mind it's a nice setup e6 knight g7 because you can go for d5 then it looks good i mean it's hard to get in but that's a nice break i show where white's weaknesses are on the d file because they push the e and c pawns weakening the d file squares that can't be guarded by pawns as we've talked about a lot you have f5 break sometimes and you have obviously the your pawn chains aiming here classic a6 b5 in a sicilian or in english why well, can do that too would be four so yeah but let's say we just happen to go actually that is a move right that's going a little better for white because i mean if you just meet them in the middle it can only really favor the person with the first move if anything right black is just going for yeah e equality there but if black wants more they should you know the tight move ironically the move that doesn't strike that and doesn't take much center is actually the strongest it seems because it gives you more potential it imbalances things more potential to attack their center but the moment you go e5 you do give up that chance to strike in the middle it's probably not happening right too much control over d5 d4 but that's where we see breaks on the flanks so you can still go for certainly the f5 like we're talking about king's indians certainly f5 for black f4 for white and you can do uh, probably a, a, a six and b five for both sides. B four for so you can see this is it's usually about where the pawn chain's aiming. But now we're aiming in both directions, so it kind of justified to go both ways, you know. So it just depends on kind of you play it out. Kind of depends on opportunities based on what you and your opponent do. Hey, maybe you go for h five h four. That's possible too. You want that? Okay. So yeah, it just depends. But generally speaking, when we have a locked up center, we're going to go for flank breaks. And and again, as Lay was getting at that's gonna it's gonna unleash our pieces it's giving us space too so we see that in the king's indian where we keep, you guys have seen where they go f5 f4 again pawn chain only difference really is you have a c pawn there so on c7 so we have our f5 f4 we're gaining space by pushing our pawns. so we have more maneuverability behind the pawns like that's your that's like your fortress being your your kingdom is being expanded right and you have the yeah you have the pieces coming behind it and obviously as i said the rooks want freedom yeah, the last ones to come out, but obviously with F5, you can take and you can open up the F file and same thing, A6, B5, take, open up the B file. So you see really this is the purpose of the pawn breaks, right? Gaining space, opening lines, squeezing, potentially squeezing your opponent. You can always bypass, keep that in mind. So you can take now, you can both take, maybe even take back with the G pawn, just hypotheticals, right? Maybe you take with the G pawn, you have more center. Anyway, let's jump into some concrete examples. So, so far though, based on this kind of preliminary analysis uh, overview. Do you guys have any thoughts, questions at first? You just wanna, okay, you ready to jump into it then? Yeah, well, well, well it, it'll become like elucidated as we go in. And hey, Nikki, I saw you just come in. How's it, came in, how's it going? Oh, and, cool. and, and Richard, maybe Lynn, how you guys doing? Great, it was good to see you. It's good to see everyone. I always struggle with uh, the palm breaks. Uh, in between, uh, in for example, uh, with white, uh, you said sorry, horizontal b5 or b5. Uh, I guess I don't have a good analysis. Just, I usually pick this is part not the right move. I pick the one in which I have more attackers and defenders, but I realize that's the wrong way or uh, uh, okay. an accurate way to play it. So Oh, so you're saying you don't you don't time it? Okay, I missed part of it, and it was like it was glitching. But you said you you maybe make the break if the the timing of the break might be wrong, or you uh, the, 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 like the, the evaluation the evaluation is wrong because mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm picking up the, the the palm break mostly on whether I have more attackers defenders. If that's not good, then there needs to be better analysis, like uh, like temp or or there there, there needs to be more analysis, like what the Right, right. So you so you make it really tactical. Oh, sorry, yeah, it's breaking up. It so, broke up again. There's yeah. one. Sorry, it like broke up. So I thought you finished. And the uh, to the knowledge of that, like when it. So there's like tactical elements. So like when you can achieve it, then there's the strategic element of like, is this the right break to make? Right. In general, is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's both. That's the interesting thing about it. Um, 
Yeah. So for example, if we were to go F5, you'd have to make, or you have to make sure you have backup for it, unless you want to sack the pawn. Maybe you can sack the pawn if they have like a bunch of stuff on it. Maybe they have like G4 and you want to break. Maybe they have a bunch of stuff on it, but maybe you want to do it anyway to reach some weaknesses. That would be a classic example of like them having a ton of control, right? So you go D5, like I said, pretty hard to do because they could just take with the C pawn and just win the pawn. But hey, there is a defensive game. I think we looked at that once. There's a defensive game where like there's an E5 break and just like sack the pawn, but it, uh, it's a, it creates a counterattack after uh, being under a ton of pressure. So yeah, you can, it can alleviate your burden sometimes. It's very annoying for the attacker to face pawn breaks as kind of sacrifices or counterattacks because they think they're comfortable. Like, oh no, they can't do this move. They're going to lose a pawn. But then suddenly, yeah, they're down a pawn, but lines blow open or they're like do one break and they have another pawn to meet that and like give up two for one, but they blast open lines. Like, oh crap, I can't just carry out my attack, you know, untrammeled like I was hoping to do and uh we have kushal guys kushal came in he's, he's new from from calcutta or Kolkata, i guess but you just call it calcutta that's like the older name uh, it's they changed it to Kolkata recently right you prefer calcutta i know at least i've heard uh k-o-l-k-a-t-e more more recently but yeah but yeah he's from there and then he's talking about how there's the first gm is from there and uh Anand is from uh, Southeast, uh, which, which uh, Tamil Nadu, right? So yeah, we're gonna look at some Anand too. And uh, Uday, yeah, Uday is also from India. He's not here today, but he, and he's from Mumbai. So let's see, let's take a look at some French games. Uh, what do you guys wanna start with, French or Kings Indian? I'm happy with either. Me too. The French, cause I'm always getting trapped. I'm always trapping myself unintentionally with my pawns. In terms of like not being able to free your position, like oh wait with black. Yeah, so it's so uh, when I play black, I always end up trapping myself. Okay, so like so, sometimes do you because when, when you get your C five break in, that's it should be liberating to some extent, uh, at least on the C file and stuff. But do you get kind of where do you tend to get squeezed or trapped? Like if you could think of in general, like is it is it just that you don't get your pieces out? Like, do you ever if you go C5, like I mentioned earlier, if you go C5, C4, you're giving up a lot of tension. We talk about, you know, keeping the tension. So you want that pressure on D4. That's where you might get squeezed. Cause yeah, you're squeezing them on the queen side, but they do have that central pawn that's squeezing you, invading your territory, right? And they got that F4, you know, trying yeah. to go for F5. They could just build, you know push those pawns at you and that's kind of their domain yeah you could counter them but it's kind of hard because they're gonna have a lot of force over there and they do have that pawn chain that's going to aim at the king side that's the thing about it we haven't spoken about yet really a little bit yeah but it, the break should occur traditionally where your pawns are aiming so that's why it's indicated that based on the pawns aiming to the queen side black would go c5 and white would do the uh, f4 f5 break traditionally there's some games where they just kind of like gain space too, maybe H5. Again, you can often push your H pawn to make breaks, but again, just thematically central breaks. But we also have our attacking the pawn chain at the head. So oh, I didn't think I got to that yet because Nikki mentioned F6. We were talking about the base, but you can go F6. Again, that's a little less like, quote, traditional, I guess. Uh, this is or thematic, but it is. No, it's like a secondary break. Because think about it. You can lay siege to their center, try to get rid of their D pawn, trade it off. Let's say you trade off this one. You just liquidate that center, right? So anyway, let's take a look at it now. So this is a Zara book. I've seen him play at the uh, Marshall Chess Club actually in New York. I think he won it when I was there, the Marshall Chess Club Championship. It's a really fun tournament. It's just a pretty small tournament in that historic Marshall Chess Club, right? That row house. That's a lot of fun. Uh, okay, so C3. So he beats Fishbine. Zara book versus Fishbine. So nice C6, Knight F3, Queen B6. There should be two. So it's kind of a passive line. And I think, Jordan, you mentioned to me the, I think we talked about the A3 line, right, Jordan? A3, B4 stuff. It looks passive. Yeah, I, I play the A3, like, exclusively now. Yeah, so if you look at that, I don't know why Bishop B2 even scores well. I don't like it. but I don't either. It's, it's, it's I think a thing. It's, like, I it's a thing. It just, it's what? I wouldn't be worried at all if somebody played that. Yeah, it's it's not really creating pressure. Maybe there's some... A lot of times there are gambit lines where like white doesn't even take back on D4. That's mm -hmm. actually okay. Funny. Yeah, that makes sense. But uh, but yeah, it's it seems very passive. A3 is actually a thing. 
So the main line is C4, which actually closes things. But but yeah, it's very annoying. Let's, let's say black kind of develops routinely, like bishop d7, for example. Look at that score, though. White tends to do very well. Like Again, yeah, you can, this is kind of a thematic idea. Let's say they're forcing black to take, forcing their hand. And then white is stabilized, you know, pretty well. If you go a5, they just bypass, you know, it's pretty mm -hmm. annoying. So so black is hoping for like some some kind of uh, free play on the queen side. But white, this is where white's like, and Jordan, yeah, you showed me a game once. Knight c3 to a4 to c5, something like that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that was, that's difficult for black to handle. And there's another, fa yeah, the famous mm -hmm. game, Harakon mm -hmm. and everything, where white, even though that seems like black's domain, yeah, white can go there. But just like with f6, that's where black chooses to play on the king side, even though that seems to be white's domain. Point is you have flexibility, but generally speaking, you know, you got to know your classic breaks, which uh, are in accordance with the pawn structure where it's aiming, breaking at the base of the pawn chain. Okay, so we have this, which should be two, takes, takes. So you see this is all pretty much in line with a lot of the theory. Knight g7 or knight h6 inviting the bishop to take. But then again, it's like, hey, oh yeah, yeah, that's actually tactical. Because if the bishop takes on h6, then you can take b2. Because it seems like, hey, that's the bad bishop. But you just, gen this is solid though. I mean, you can go knight f5 and attack. Oh, did someone say something? No. There's some background noise. Okay, so knight a3, it looks a bit funny. It's just, it's the main move, okay. But now you're seeing it's about even. White's not really scoring any better. So black is fine out of the opening. Highly imbalanced, just how you play it. So there's your target, right? We're threatening the d-pawn with three versus two. Knight c2, bishop d7. Okay, now that's just and weak. G4. That's just weakening. I mean, it's tempting, but I I circled all those weaknesses. Okay, yeah. now we're, are we still we still have a few. What? How many games do we have here? There's still been a few games, huh? Interesting. Shirov won and MVL won. Twenty eighteen, more recently. Interesting. Wait, who did he play against? Oh, we have quite no. This is like theory. We have the we have their game. Where where's Zerabak won? Oh, we have Gurevich winning. So we have some strong players winning there, and we have a uh, MVL. Uh, 2600. I don't know he, who he is. I don't know if you guys know who he is, the third one. And then obviously Shira, one of the best. So yeah, back in yeah 90s, 2000. So G4, Knight FD7. So he has to go back. Seems like a concession, but not really. I think white's making more of a concession than black. I mean, it could, it's, it's double-edged. White's gaining space, but he's like, no, get out of there, Knight. But I think it's more that black, black provokes that. because he, he made white worry about. I mean, look at how passive white is defending the, the pawn uh that we've attacked by we, we put pressure on it we've created a target via our pawn break right so anyway I, let's see how much the the rest is pertinent to our breaks oh there's another break so that just shows you right you know it doesn't have to be um based on the pawn again that's the typical way classic way but look anytime like in Aroy lopez b5 is played you go a4 usually g4 is played we can go we can go h5 right and the other thing uh, about that what if white reacts now first of all they can't ignore it because we're threatening to take the pawn based on a tactical pin like in the immortal game you guys remember that where there's like this stuff on the h file where uh, black is trying to you know take advantage of the h1 rook kind of similar right so you see similarities in terms of striking at those g and b pawns and stuff but yeah taking advantage of the pin so what do they do they just move away but let's say the pawn were to push or take even why is that probably not a good idea for white to over to overreact, which black wants. What's going to happen there? Well, I guess you could put your knight back where it was. Yeah, exactly. That's the whole point, right? Like, okay, I just chased you away. Come back <laughs> again, and it, it renews the threat. And again, anytime the bishop moves, we can certainly consider. I'm doing a chess class, so uh, <laughs> chess. I'm doing uh, pawn breaks. So attacking d4, taking on b2, right? So it's just problematic. And taking, you know, I've done this in a Karo Khan when they get really aggressive with like h4, g5. I play h5 and I had a really cool blitz game like that. They took, I'm like, just ignore the pawn, get my knight on f5. But also the thing is if they bypass, keep, there's a nice Capablanca game like this. It's actually a Karo Khan. But tomorrow, okay, but after, after this pawn push, you just lock it up. You can castle kingside very comfortably. That's what Capablanca did, same idea versus a Kara Khan advanced variation. G6, Bishop G7, Castles, and White just couldn't get in. So Black has free play where they want to play, and then White killed their own king side play. So that's a huge part of it. You say, hey, I know my opponent wants to play on the king side where their space is. I shut them down, and I have, I could do whatever I want where, where on my side of the board, where, where I have kind of my domain, where I have pressure, where my pawns are aiming. 
pawns indicating and where you play. And you can see yeah, if you look at the uh, study, kind of some ex some other explanations there. But conceding that H file play, that black has now control of the only open file. Or sorry, the C file's open too. No one's taken that yet. I think black might take that too though. So looking at weak squares, there should be seven. But yeah, the rest, like I said, there were some pawn breaks. Let's see if there's another one. I think those are the main, there might be F6 too, we'll see. But certainly you can already see those breaks were well, opened uh, the C file, the H file, created weaknesses. So you guys can see the benefits already, self-evident, right? Do you guys have any questions about um, what we've achieved? I mean, if nothing else, you can, the rest is the finish, right? I'm sure black has an edge. I'd say, you know, a computer says probably some big edge. Let's see what it says. I wouldn't be, I'd be surprised if not. I'm a little surprised. It's saying only a small edge, minus 0.5. Oh, now it's saying zero. I don't know. It's saying B4. Who's going to play B4? So it's okay. Let's say let's say white does something regular. I don't know, like bishop develop. No, you can't do that. Okay, whatever. Rook b1. Now it's saying like minus one. I thought it. I guess because there's still a lot of play and they could find like some benefits. But I think strategically, I mean, it's still good for black. Obviously, even the computer thinks that in, in general lines. I don't know about b4. It's just hanging. That's messy. Then maybe rook going after. But point is that black is better strategically as well. So it's it's very difficult for white. But we're gonna squeeze a little more out of it to grow our advantage. We'll see. In a few moves, I think it'll agree. Okay, castle's queen side. That's interesting. Well, in this case, you don't like castle king side. It's already open. Why would you move your rook away from the only open file? We'd be giving up something, right? We could play king b8, rook c8, right? There's your, oh, he did before. Get out of the way. Okay, going for a pawn storm. Why not? Got to try. Take the file. But you see black has the piece placement. And yeah, white, you see what's, what, what white is doing is uh, just pushing pawns on the flanks. They're not really getting any breaks though. So again, the thematic break for white is F4F5. So you see the, the breaks that black got is giving him the activity. White's not getting the play. Okay, whatever. Just deal with it, you know. I think B5 just takes the A pawn with your knight, right? It doesn't seem that it works. You can play B6, anchor. Now, actually, you'd love to take A5 because guess where your knight's going to go? Uh, where are you going to go if they play B5? Think about the journey of the night. It's gonna go to D eight. Oh no, you can you can even take you don't even need to, man. Let's say you take the pawn because they weaken the a pawn, right? Oh yeah, right, where, right, where, right. Where are you going now? Even more dangerous. You get a free pawn. You get oh, a free they pawn. Think, they maybe think, oh, I open the a file, half of an a file. It's not that big of a deal. You can play b six, queen covers, or you can just stay there, lock it up. No, you're fine because the knight's gonna go somewhere else. Actually, it helps black a lot. Where's the knight going from a five? What's the journey? From A5? Yeah. Four? B3. B3 slash? B3. A5, B3. B3. Or? Or yeah. A5. Um, you can go there. Yeah, you can anchor it on C4 by the pawn. The piece yeah, you could. I mean, the bishop yeah. wants to, that's the good bishop for white. You'll be happy. Yeah, I need to, cool to get rid of that guy. The beautiful thing about it, that bishop, I think he got there. The bishop's coming to B5. So your quote, bad bishop becomes a monster on b5, uncontested if the bishop takes. If they don't take, you have a monster on c4. If they do take, you have a monster on b5. So either way, it's like total domination by black. Okay, I'm, okay. like I said, I'm pretty sure the computer is going to agree that it's really good in a minute. Oh, and then he just takes a pawn. Okay, let's see. I, I don't know. I think it's got to be just to check. Okay, it doesn't like it as much as me. I mean, minus one is good, but I think it's, I want it to be more than that. Um, but yeah, it it does. I mean, it, it prefers black, but it's not saying it's winning. It's saying it's advantageous. All right. I'm so no, confused about his king move and everything. Like, I'm not sure, like, why White moved his king over there. Oh, oh, that's a good question. Let's see. Where did he do? I'm sorry to go back and. No, no, that's it, interesting. But I just, no, no, good, I don't I get it. That's not about it. Uh, I guess, um, well, there are checks on dark squares. There are no checks on light squares. Okay. And it does get a little bit away from the center. Although it actually moves closer to potential attack. And like I said, if there if there are any issues with the bishop being challenged or trading off, the yeah, king I guess after g four, like I mean, I guess after g four, he's not playing on castling over there. So true, think, and, and after rook move, he just can't. Yeah, right? yeah like, maybe, he well, can maybe, maybe he'll copy white. No, he can't do it anymore because he pushes the pawns. But maybe he can copy white. Maybe that's. But it's just bad position. I don't know. Whatever. Okay, I mean minus one's good, but yeah. But then again, you'll be like. It, we've talked about like you'll have two pieces for a rook and be like minus six but obviously two pieces for a rook is way better but things can happen right you never know they might win some pawns back you, you never know right 
but it's not minus six necessarily. Is it looking like 30 moves ahead or something and seeing a win? But in this case, it says minus one, but I think it's better from a human perspective because it's like positionally almost winning. All right. I mean, again, you have work to do, but it's bad. So King F1, but again, like if they want to go castle queen side, they're like, oh, well, I moved my bishop I have hand in my B pawn maybe. There's some, there's some stuff against B7, but it's just difficult for white to play. And again, that bishop's a bad bishop on C1. It's tied down just to B2, but even if it comes out, it's going to be blocked by its pawns, basically. So king over, that's a problem with the closed position, just like our bishop on D7, but we will probably get it to B5. That's a typical theme, right? Or B6, bishop A6, or you know, bishop D7, bishop B5. We're going to get that bishop on the A6, F1 diagonal. That's the goal. We free our last piece. We don't even need to castle, but figure, hey, they might want to go at four or five. We're pretty safe. And again, you got to assess. It looks a little scary, but it's not really because they don't have any further attack. And then he just wins the pawn. Yeah, you have to be careful. I mean, the line's open. He's got a little counterplay, but just defend a little bit. It's like, I'm up a pawn. I have a great position. They have an A6 pawn. They're not going anywhere with it. Just don't get mated on B7. That's not going to happen. Right? <laughs> A6 pawn is actually a liability later. What if, again, what if we do, what if we get our bishop on B5? That bishop has to babysit the A6 pawn. Like later on, you know, they want to trade rooks or something. Pieces get traded off. Maybe you have like king C7, B5, king B6, win the A pawn, game over, two connected pass pawns. So it can get very bad for white. Yeah, you're not getting mated coming in there. And this is, okay, can I, can we, can Stockfish say it's winning yet? I think we're getting close. <laughs> really? It keeps saying like close to minus uh, one. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. I don't know. Okay, whatever. It's. I mean, it always prefers black, but it's not like, it's just because it finds, it finds like ridiculous defenses, I guess, to hold on. But it's, I think it's very bad. Come on, look at those open lines. The only problem is the bishop on e8 is still not finding his liberation, right? Everything else looks good. But I mean, look at the king position too. I mean, come on, king b8 can't be touched. King f1, we can hit it in many ways, right? It's just good. Maybe we can go like block the queen with bishop over and like, then we can check them or something. There's so many ways to attack them. Rook h2, I mean, yeah, that's a good idea. I think it's overwhelming, honestly. Again, computer might find a way to hang on and still be worse, but I think a human is really hard to hold this position. Okay, now he wins another pawn. Thanks. Yeah, it's a, okay. One more time. I'm just curious. Finally. Yeah, minus, there you go. Okay. Finally. Well, I guess it wanted that extra pawn. I mean, come on. Extra pawn plus king plus king. But you see what happened there. So it's a consequence of the target on d4, right? And and now and now e5 is a target, g4 is a target, the knight's hanging. Yeah, he's probably gonna lose more pawns. I mean, it's not getting mated yet. We really want the inclusion of our bishop. Once our bishop comes into b5, we find well, like we have this idea again here. I guess he didn't see enough yet. He's like, hey, I'll just pick off your d pawn. But by picking off the d pawn, you're in there. But also, yeah, e5 is really problematic. We try to win the e pawn in many ways. The knight moves, we have like maybe a fork in some cases. Uh, we have the H file. It's just, uh, that's why. Okay. But now it's completely winning before it was strategically winning. Now it's like tactically winning and you're up material. Okay. That's just bad. Well, he's already getting crushed. So it probably just makes matters worse. It's kind of just hard to do anything. And then now we have lateral attack very much like the Capablanca game, famous game versus Nimzovich. Uh, I guess, I don't know, or 19 teens. I think it was, uh, but very cool games. Look up. I think it's Nimzovich Capablanca, Karo Khan game. Look that up. Beautiful game breaks in c file for fifth rank pressure and stuff fourth rank okay so oh there's the pawn how many pawns are we up now three pawns oh they got that pawn okay fine but now they're probably getting mated soon now okay what this is kind of cool wait let me get sorry don't look on the right now that we have tactics let's just go back to our board with our analysis so what do you guys think uh is going on with this move why is it a good move um It seems that white is trying. Is it made on e? It's made by the queen. Wait, hold on. Okay, wait. Okay, you guys said. Okay, Lynn was going first, and you. Got, I think I heard something too. Lynn, what were you saying? No, I didn't say anything. Oh, someone, something. Something. someone said something. Someone said something first. Queen e four is made, right? Said, what's that? Queen e four. Queen e four is made. It's pretty hard to stop. Well, they can use the queen, but they obviously can't take the rook. Then I think I heard Richard and some of the. Yeah, you guys saw it, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so it's a clearance sacrifice. Because the rook didn't do anything yet. I guess you have a check, but then they can get away for now. But this is pretty, pretty dangerous <laughs> because you're threatening mate here. Mating, I mean, the king's out there is very dangerous. But okay, I think the queen has to come out, yeah? So they stopped the mate. Check him. Well, now it's a four. Pretty hopeless at this point. 
Ng2. And this is cool. I mean, I guess that he probably, does he, I mean, he could have taken C2, but we don't, if you don't need to, don't do it, right? I mean, yeah, but you could, yeah, you have Bishop F1 check. So obviously you can do that first, see if you had mate, take the rook whenever you want. Instead, the once, the once bad bishop is now our, our hero bishop. Oh, nice. So it just shows uh, it's not permanent necessarily because of our pawn break. King H2. Okay, that's just terrible. How many? We're just eating all their pawns. Yeah, this is. Yeah, this is brutal. I mean, again, look at the relative king safety. Okay, if they push E6 check later, they might have a king at a check, but it's just not, it's too slow, obviously. Okay, wait. So he goes, he takes this, picks up a pawn in the process with the check. Then he checks again, but he has an X ray, so the queen will take. If he, okay, comes back. Oh, it's a windmill. Nice. Oh my God. So he's able to, it's like the Fisher, not as cool as the Fisher game. A game is central to check, check, check. Come on. Is he still playing on? <laughs> no, no, he resigns on that moment. Yeah, he resigns right now. I mean, he's down too much material. He doesn't have a mate yet, I guess. Is there a mate? Uh, I don't think there's a mate, but it's it's over. I mean, let's just take the rook, maybe. <laughs> you're up a rook and a bishop, and you're about to mate him. So I, I imagine there's a mate, but. Uh, this is convincing enough, right? And yeah, there's no, and, the and, now, and now there's not even E6 possibilities because you're blocking. What's that? I just take the rook. Yeah. I take the lazy way. I just yeah, take let me it. See if there's a mate. Uh, yeah, it says take the rook and then mate in seven. <laughs> well, that's just an overwhelming amount of material and an exposed king. So anyway, we don't need to evaluate much at that point. We just know <laughs> it's okay. But um, yeah, it's interesting though. I thought that, you know, again, I think it was strategically winning. Computer says minus one, but strategically winning. And so, and so bye guys. See you later. All right, have fun. <laughs> All right, going for an outing. Um, takes, yeah. And that, that was critical though. That bishop, again, it, it was a passive bishop, but once it rears its head, and how did he lose the bishop? I uh, That was probably uh, the end of it, you know? Strict, uh, tactic. That's when it becomes very tactical. I mean, why are you take, <laughs> taking the knight? It's just not necessary. Because you know that bishop's going to find a way in, you know, and 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 you give that up. We have our again, un, as we spoke about a first time win, uncontested light squared bishop, uncontested bishop, and yeah, we get in and game over. So that's pretty cool, right? So what what do you guys take away from that game? I I think that White played a really weird line. I know that it said that it was um book or whatever, but I literally have never seen that. I mean, yeah, I've seen like the A3 and all that, but I've never, like I played French for a really long time and I've never seen like that weird G4 king move over thing. Not that I played, you know, that long, but you know. No, but you, yeah, you know. Yeah, you know it's atypical. Yeah. Uh, wait, what like, year was this? It, well, well, Zarebuck's not that old. I think he's in his 20s. So it couldn't have been that long ago. Whereas Fishmine's more of a veteran player, right? I think so. Um, so yeah, um, let's see. This was, where is our game here? Let's go forward. Do you see it? This game. Well, let me go forward a little bit and you'll see the year. It was uh 2016. Oh, okay. So not too long ago. Well, it feels like a long time ago, <laughs> but after the pandemic, everything seems like too long yeah, ago. Yeah. Uh anyway, so yeah, any other takeaways with our pawn breaks? Well, I like what you said about the G4 and then like then you just play H5. Yeah, it's like a little pawn break, right? It's a mini break. It's not a break based on a clo anything closed, really. But no, it's, well, the factor of the H file is closed. So it does open up the H file, right? Half open H file. And then fully yeah. open H file when they go H3. And you can see, though, just to go back to that point, the strength of H5. Because if they if they don't take, you you win the pawn. Let's say they decide to guard the pawn. Like, let's say, I don't know, they can't even move the knight. No, they can't, can't take, okay. No, they can't do anything, honestly. But let's say, hypothetically, that they take back with a piece. Well, then they have a weak H pawn. Mm -hmm. And you have connected pawns, so you can easily go like uh, uh, G6 and hold everything together. And again, if they go G5, you so you're probably not going to castle queenside unless they go G5. That's your cue to castle kingside. You know, you lock it up, and then you have again. See, you've already created your play on the queen side, and they can't do much because they're so tied to D4. So what the whole point of his opening is to defend is pa passively defend the D pawn, right? So pretty cool, huh? Yeah, it's a good game. Okay. Second one. Oh, there's Anna. All right. It was a nice I had a question. Uh -huh. For the pawn break, should you do it as soon as possible or let there be, or like increase the tension or? 
Mm. It seems like they're three way. Well, I mean, you would have to break eventually, I would think. So but the question is always when to do yeah. it. The timing, right. And you'll see, and that's kind of a thing, like each game is a case study because they're not like, um, yeah, you can come up with, you can try to generalize it, but it's, 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 you know, it is particular to each position, but like, for example, in a French, it's just the thing to do. Like we know the line, you play C5 on like move three, right? One, two, yeah, pretty much on move three, you're going to play it in French, right? Or if they lock it. Um, yeah. I, I kind of see it like, we see, delayed, uh, we see delayed breaks in other games and we'll figure out, but usually, yeah, typically if it's later on, you will want to build first. You want to make sure that you're not going to get counterattacked on that line either. So you're going to build then you, know, then you build up your potential energy, then potential energy, then it erupts, right? Well, we'll see. It right, too. right. And when, and when it erupts, that's when you have to be prepared to make your attack, attack or either go to a space that's available for you to make an, an attack. So, you but you gotta, yeah. for me, it's like, okay, I, I make any other moves that make sense. So I gotta go ahead and make this break and, and plan accordingly. You know what I mean? Yeah, you said Rook's getting behind it. No, I didn't say that. What did you say about the rooks? I didn't say anything about the rooks. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant I thought you mentioned rooks at some point. No, I didn't. But but yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's not rooks. Hold on a second. Put it back, please. Yeah. All right, you took my video <laughs> camera. But um, but anyway, as for the maybe I wanted to hear rooks, but but yeah, you definitely want the rooks to be active too. But yeah, yeah, you got to be prepared, right? You got to be prepared. But um, yeah, the pieces need to be in place. I mean, sometimes, David, is it possible that, you know, you you just have to go ahead and make the break because there's nothing else available to you? Oh, and you mentioned that, right. So it's like if there's, well, it, I mean, you, you it's like something you want to do and you want to do it right. You want to prepare it. But also uh, it would be more like you you want to, it's going to be forced in a way if, if you need to do it to get counterplay. Right. So, it, it, I mean, that's what I mean. A forced, a no. forced break. Mm -hmm. Right. No, Sorry, what's that? No. No, I was saying a, a forced break. A for Wait, sorry, he's gonna go in the other room. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay, well, you I'm have a difficulty. I'll, I'll be right there. I'll be right there. Okay. Okay, put it back. All right. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to see himself in the camera. Okay, not right now. Later on, we do not during the class. Okay. Yeah, it's not working. Okay, he's gonna see real quick. All right, but no, we don't. Okay. Well, hello. <laughs> Look at this cutie pie. <laughs> all, right, all right, come on. Here's the thing. No, later, Jake. I'm doing the class later. You go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, later. We can't do it right now. Can you hear Bye, guys. Sorry, later, later. <laughs> He's gonna do it later when it's not the middle of a group class. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Yeah, he likes that camera. Um, yeah, it's like it's like a mirror, right? Okay. It's so cute. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, the question, uh, Lynn. Yeah, but does that does that kind of answer your question in terms of like like when is it necessary? I mean, you don't do it in terms of is there nothing better to do? Well, ideally, it's like no, that's the thing that I just need to do, right? That's right. My, but in terms of nothing better to do, uh, no, I, th I think it's more like, um, yeah, by if there's nothing. Well, at that point, is that a forced break? What do you mean forced? I if mean, if yeah, I mean, it? it's nothing better to do, so you have to just break it and and break it open to make action and stuff start to happen. You just yeah, have to and, make it. Right. And, it's and like again, a forced break. And again, especially when they have pressure on you, it would be like a form of counter. And that's where I mentioned it might even be like a pawn sack or something. You're kind of effectively forced to do it, right? Because if you go do it, you're going to, you know, like Leia was talking about, when she gets squeezed. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. So maybe F6 is a little ugly sometimes, like we can three, six pawn and stuff. We'll look at that. But hey, I mean, if you don't do it, you're going to get smothered on the king side in that case. So hey, at least it opens up the F file, which actually helps you defensively. You're like, okay. Give some to get some. I get the F file, which gives me counterplay, unless my rook lift for defensive purposes, maybe. Keep some of their pieces out. Maybe sack. Well, we're going to see how it works, I think, in the next game. And uh -huh. David, that, that that has become my mantra. Give some to get some. <laughs> that's Yeah, and then that's where your judgment comes into play, right? Right, what, right. What are you willing to give? <laughs> yeah, like the positional sacrifices. Yes, exactly. Whether it's a sacrifice or not, you're always, you're, you're, whenever you trade something, you could say, quote, sacrificing something, right? Yeah. You're sacrificing, uh, a, you're giving up a weakness, you're giving up a file, you're giving up, uh, you're, you might be compromising your own king position, 
maybe you're you're actually winning material but you're quote sacrificing your king position in a way you know so so it's uh it's just that we use sacrifice as, as materially but it doesn't really have to be you're just it's again it's more like viewed as a trade you're trading something for something else so if you play f6 you're getting the activity on the f file but you're weakening your e6 pawn that's usually the main consequence of it and you're just like hey i'm willing to do that because i yeah lynn as you talk about are you is like is it like a soft force you know what i mean like it's like soft forced it's like you don't have to do it but you may but you kind of yeah it's just a question of you, you you may want to just want to do it because it'll enhance your next uh movability on the on on the board you know yeah, yeah. And, and and then again then we'll kind of get to something i think well, yeah, some other some of you guys think Richard touched. And, and you have to remember, you have a game you want to play, and, and you don't want to just succumb to your opponent's actions and you know early on. So you you just got to be kind of forceful yourself. Yeah, <laughs> Come no, on yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, initiative seeking. You're seeking. That's part of your initiative, right? Initiative, the break right. does create. The break does create initiative. Okay, so let's take a look at the key. Now, why don't we just look at the key? The CI said F4. F4. So we basically see kind of. It's kind of like an art of attack in chess, how Vukovic breaks down like all the different values. Like, okay, here's how we attack an uncastled king. Here's how we attack the king that's lost the right to castle. Here's how we attack the, the castled king if it's Fianchetto, if it's Queenside, you know? So I'm trying to, you know, using that sort of model in terms of, let me, let's look at every single break, at least in a French and, you know, a French, a king's Indian and the other ones and Benoni kind of. But yeah, we'll break it down. So this one's the F4, F5 break, which see, there's the knight C3, which is generally regarded as better, right? Than the early yeah. E5. That's you know main stuff. Uh, or bishop, that. um, bishop g5. I always have a lot of trouble with. Uh here? Yeah. If White does I, bishop g5. Yeah, I have yeah, a Judith lot of Polgar, trouble with it. Judith Polgar has one of her most brilliant games. You know that sack, a queen sack. <laughs> if you, you know that game, she goes bishop g5 and then she takes it. Yeah, she's like a monster. <laughs> she's like uh, everything. Yeah, we should look at that game. I'm not sure if we've looked at it in the class. I think we looked at it once, but it's a very cool game. Not d7, f4. Yeah, we should look at her. We've looked at other uh, top women players. We should definitely look, focus on Judith Bulgar too. That's a great player to look at. I mean, among the best, right? So nice C6. Now, in this case, Anand is, is actually not attempting to hold the, the pawn on D4. He's like, I don't need to take back with my C pawn. So interestingly, he's not going to kind of have that pawn chain that just, you know, directly aims at the king side. It, it's a different approach. It's very interesting. It worked out for him. He's trying to minimize the impact of Black's break. Of course, Black gets play though. It's kind of different. A6, Queen D2, B5. So he's going for queenside play, you know. So he figures it's kind of like in the line where the knight goes behind the C pawn. Maybe he wants like a knight or queen behind the B pawn. But yeah, it's B5, B4 is annoying, right? Queenside play. So there's an H4. Like I mentioned, you don't need to. I mean, see, the thing is, you don't go G4 because probably not because then he hits you with H5. And again, you're you're going to have to. You know, it's uncomfortable. I don't think anyone's doing that. Yeah, no one's doing G4 right now. There's H4. 37 versus 20 percent uh yeah black is not scoring great in these lines so it seems like obviously anna knows his theory so it's a good line for white it looks like uh black has his resistance though but h4 just squeezing this way but again g4 just fails because h5 and you can't guard with h3 again because it'll take the rook so you can't maintain a pawn on g4 right now because of h5 which, mean, which means you can't support f5 can't buttress that so we're going to do it when we're ready H4, H5, B4, Knight, A4. Interesting, Knight on the flank, but looking at some important squares there on the, you know, so kind of challenging, challenging Black's kind of supremacy over there on the queen side. C takes D4, Bishop F2. I said, interestingly, it's been a while since I wrote this, but I said Black pawns restrict the movement of their pieces. Oh, what I'm getting at is like the, their own piece. So that's kind of the argument that Anna's making is like, hey, uh, there's always implied arguments in every game, right? There's implicit arguments is that, hey, you you got to take my pawn. I could take whenever I want, but I want it to be there because it's in your own way since you have no friendly mm -hmm. fires. So like, well, first of all, no bishop c5. I guess there's knight c5 stuff. That's probably what needs to happen. But it's interesting how he deals with this. So it just shows you a creative approach against the French. So sometimes, again, you just don't, you let that, you ignore the break effectively, but you have to support your e5 pawn. We talk about overprotection. Nimzovich is, you know, I think kind of, you know, sample overprotection game, which is just ridiculous. But it's it, no, I mean, in terms, I, I don't think it's a real game. But the way he holds it, he just, he just like overprotects the e5 pawn. He ignores everything else. But it's it ends up working. It's pretty cool. I think it's a sample game. If you guys know about it, the immortal. Look up the. Uh, I think it's called the immortal overprotection game. So knight a5, at least on chessgames.com with their creative names. So knight takes c4. But this is nice, right? 
So rather than the pawn, you have the knight supporting. But again, so we've dealt with their pawn break in a very interesting way. Now we want our break. Hey, maybe we do it like we talked about earlier. You do it for initiative, right, Lynn? So maybe that means giving up your e-pawn. I mean, not, probably not with check, but maybe we'll move the king. Maybe it is with check. Who knows? Then you play rook, king, f1. And rook. We have to be creative here is saying, hey, I'm going to let you maybe do something. Like, at least we have to think about it. We have to think about f5. Let's see what they do. We have to think about going f5 at any moment because that's our break, right? That's our only break. Oh, there's h6. I don't know. Maybe it's possible too. It's like a sack because it'll break up in their territory. That's a, that's a break. It's also squeezing their king sides. So like let's say you have a rook lift and attack g7, right? So many ideas here. So again, remember like we talked about last game with black h5. Now white's the one who does h4, h5, right? Um, but yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, f5 is in the air. Probably g4 first, right? Just got to watch out for that king again. So let's try and do a better version than Fishbine, right? Where his g4 really hurt him. But keep in mind, there's no h5 against h g4. So Anand knows that. He's prepared. Yeah, again, it just wasn't Fishbine's be best game. I'll say it. So it, it happens. Knight takes c6. Interesting, right? It's it's actually uh, the quote bad bishop, but he's willing to give it up. So we saw the bad the quote bad bishop becomes good in both games. You can go to b5 and stuff, right? So let me get rid of it. But now look at our bishop. This time white has the strong bishop, see? Yeah, that bishop on d3 is tough. Yeah, with. you can't challenge it. Well, the idea is knight c5, just take it now. Uh, I guess we have to play b3, yeah, it's forced. Because there's nowhere to go with the knight. It looks weird, but I mean, yeah, it's interesting, right? It's just a weird, it's kind of a, a funky game, but... Um, but look at him. Ultimately, he got what he wanted. He's he's got the d3 bishop planted there. And it would have, yeah, it would have been, he wouldn't have had a chance. You have to keep that in mind. If you don't do it now, that bishop, well, if he goes to b5 and you take it, a takes back. You don't want to take it like that. He figures, I'm going to have to take it eventually anyway. You don't have to take that way because it opens up the rook and, well, it wins the knight, right? Because we talk about the knight on a4. You see that? Bishop b5, knight takes pawn takes, knight's trapped, not to mention opens up the, you have the half open a file, c file. That's just really good for black. So he has to know that, though. It's very important. I bet you a lot of us would just ignore that, right? No, I mean, that's the other thing, really. I mean, I mean, you kind of have to because they are, you know, you'd have to play b3, and that's kind of ugly. Bishop takes a4, pawn there. You want to hold your knight, too. But reg regardless of that, uh, still, it's the kind of thing where if you don't do it now, if you defer, kind of miss your opportunity, right? So, but you have to have that positional judgment and be decisive. And yeah, it'd be tough because I wouldn't want to get rid of that knight. I would like my knight. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's like it's kind of a hard move to make strategically yeah. because we've worked for our knight. We're proud of our knight and we're giving it up for what we thought was a terrible bishop. We're like, oh, yeah, I'm doing better here. Look at that terrible. And we've had many games, especially the worst version for black is if there's a pawn on b5 and we can blockade like a b4, a5. That bishop is not getting out anytime soon, maybe through f6 later, but it's very hard. That's what happened in the alpha zero game, actually. I think it's this one here, if I recall. But Alpha Zero did that, where it just gave up a piece, but it knew the Black's bishop was so bad, it was worth it, like a piece for a pawn. Brilliant game. Anyway, so it's, it's contrarian in a way, but you have to use your judgment here. And again, knowing when to do the break, like I said, like I said, Leia, F5 ideas, uh, but you have to time that out if you're going to do it. But see how he's building towards it? He castles, again, that's his domain. This is just a good version for white. Again, we're flipping it, right? Now it's good for white. Previously, it was good for black. But we see Anand is much safer than the previous game at Fishbine. He gets to castle, <laughs> right? But no one's touching his king, right? And keep in mind, the bishop on f2, he's not trading off those bishops to allow access to his diagonal. So you can see it's night and day versus how Fishbine handled it, right? And again, uh, going back, Nikki going back to a bad, just poor opening play that was refuted effectively. So Anand's very creative here. And okay, give some to get some. Look at our C2 pawn, Lynn, right? That's given something, isn't it? Right? See, the C2 pawn's a backward pawn, right? So we might lose it if we're not careful. We can move the queen in like rook C1, but that's a problem. We got to keep an eye on the C pawn. So we're giving that up, but we've gotten a nice piece play. We've restricted black's pieces to a large degree. The knight's on A3, but if it doesn't win C2, it's not doing that much. I think black actually wants to reroute. That would be nice, actually. But yeah, he lets him do that, but you have to prove that that's not doing that much. Queen E3, he's actually hanging the pawn. But it's not. It's it's hanging it, but it but black loses if he takes. So then he goes g6, which which allows a lot of pressure. But okay, this is important to understand. You know, again, that was a problem. It was a concession, apparently. Well, you know, a concession insofar as it is a target pawn, but it, it's a trick. It's a trap here. So white, effectively, that means white is using the, the trap embedded in this line to be able to play rook ac1 if he needs to. To guard that or maybe rook f2 later probably is rook ic1 if he needs it he holds that for now because again that's his main that's really his only problem right the queen side stuff but you shut him down just enough 
to be able to do what you need to do. But we have to keep an eye. So it's not only is it when you're timing your break, it's it's restricting their break or or minimizing the impact of their break. You see how Anand's doing that this game? I think that's very important to think about the defensive angle. You can't necessarily stop. You're not stopping C5. They're going to do that in the advanced French, no matter what, on move three. But we're, we're restricting, we're mitigating the impact, right? So, and I said, um, yeah, I just mentioned he has the tactical justification to allow the C2 pawn to, quote, fall. So what happens if knight takes C2? Again, that's embedded in the line, allows us to abandon it. To, otherwise, we would lose it anyway. So what happens if knight takes C2, guys? Think tactically now. So tactics merge with positional ideas. Is it rook EC1? If he takes? Yeah. Okay, let's say the take, rook, rook A. Yeah, rook A. Okay, what if the knight takes the queen? No. Calculate the con. We're going to trade queens, but calculate the complications there. Does it benefit us or no? For if we're playing for Anna? And rook takes queen. What would, would the bishop just take? Um... Um, Those are two branches of our calculation tree. So Richard looked at one branch, rook AC1, natural looking. You do lose your queen when you trade queens. We'll see about that materially, whether it actually works or not. And then Lynn, you mentioned the second candidate move, which is like, hey, just chop it off. Let's just take it, right? And again, we love our bishop on d3, but we have to be objective. Nice. Right? So there's a lot of lessons embedded in this. I mean, Anand's, like I said, he's a brilliant player. It's interesting, though, that we were talking about that, right? Um, we're talking about that um, today, just when uh, when Kushal came in, right? So yeah, we got we we're like, oh, we should look at this game. Here we go, great game. So what's going on here? What about? Oh, let's calculate the first line. Yeah, Rook, I don't think the first line works. I what have, what's the full? Tell me the full line. Rook AC one, knight knight takes queen, then what? Then I think uh, Rook takes queen, then uh, Rook takes Rook, and then Bishop takes. Like, so what's the, what's the material what's the material balance so what's the exchange uh, material I'm gonna down a pawn and exchange exactly we just gave yeah. up a whole pawn exchange yeah. i'll just make the yeah. line here yeah this is a blunder oh wait a second yeah that's better right. no this yeah. is not what you're no this is not what you're supposed to do yeah because takes takes they just get your rook no they get yeah. this obviously they can't take your rook on f1 because you're going to take c8 so take take and we have four against four minor, uh, four against four pieces attackers. We only can we say four pieces, right? We're looking at not the king, just the four attackers. Um, yeah, but we're. I mean, it's not like the end of the world, but we are down an exchange and a pawn, right? Yeah, we have six against seven. Yeah, it's just up an exchange. Why it might have a tiny bit of compensation, but it's pretty much losing, right? So in other words, we don't want that. Um, but yeah, so we just take. Okay, Lynn, so we probably take. Well, what happens after take take? Queen takes c2 back. What do you do then? Mm, definitely rook, maybe over. Then we go rook ac1. So we reverse the move, we'll switch the move order. What happens then? You can see then what. She can't guard her rook. Skewer, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's losing. It's it's interesting. It reminds me of a Ferrugia game. We, oh, oh, I did a video on that. It wasn't a part of the class, I think. No, no, actually, I did it with the class two in a separate video because I loved it so much before we started recording the classes. Ferruja does something cool, like with some queen swings and all that as he won. And again, that was a Karakhan. But keep in mind, the Karakhan and the French are very similar with the advanced variation. It often sort of becomes the same structure, effectively, when black plays c5. Or maybe white trades in the center, but it becomes the same thing. So g6 is played. Well, uh, that looks a little dubious to me. I don't know. He's just trying to hold off. White a little bit, but it just doesn't seem. And right. to do something with this bishop, I think, like just do something. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, bishop h six maybe. Plus, he's slowing down the f five break, so maybe he's like, you know what? There are certain lines where, where well, actually, no, no, he's ready now that he moved away. He's ready for f five, completely. Not, not even like some tactical justification. It's just straight up play f five. Yeah, and he's gonna yeah again like. It's interestingly, it's the same thing as black playing f6 and taking the e pawn, if you think about it. Just think about which pawns are missing. If they take take, if they take back with the f pawn, think about if white goes f5 and takes e6 and black takes back. So it's kind of interesting that black can initiate that. But obviously, in this case, black's not going to initiate f6 with the king right behind it, right? With the king opening up, opening up uh, against uh, the queen and the pawn's weak, rook a e1 or something. 
maybe bishop f5 hitting e a6 later with his pin no i don't know um yeah no no never mind i hallucinated but maybe like but we're gonna target it we're gonna talk no actually if it goes f6 we just take on f6 and unleash probably just unleash on the e file and e6 is a terrible weakness um yeah it's just bad a bit bad and then again we, we can then play it that's what i was thinking then we can go bishop f5 because the e pawn's pan or even like bishop e2 to g4 in certain lines but yeah e6 is a huge problem and i love how that knight on a4 it's passive looking but it does stop the pieces from challenging on c5 it, it makes it more no, i'm hallucinating sorry um it makes it well i guess you could i don't know it just makes it you're putting a lot of pressure on them though and, and you are going to get F5 and soon. But yeah, maybe he should try that. I don't know. David, did, stop hallucinating. I was hallucinating a little bit. <laughs> um, it's like AI, right? I'm like having some AI hallucinations. Uh, so G6, Queen H3. Well, now we're actually threatening the G pawn, right? But anyway, I'm getting that like, there's a lot of dark square pressure. So the knight is, he has served some function, right? Okay. So Bishop H6, this should be three, knight B5. Look at three. So this is cool though. This is a great example actually of prepping. We know we want f5, but Leia, this is a great example of timing. So there's you get your knight c3 and fine. But interestingly, yeah, we you know that knight is off sides. Fine, we'll just trade it off. But now the pressure on c2 is eliminated. So yeah, you know. But again, no, as for c5, I just keep looking at that. I mean, obviously black wouldn't mind playing knight c5 and coming in or taking the bishop, right? On d3. But you know, at least he's taking away pressure on C2. So that's just sitting there, beautiful bishop on D3 and on E3. But that D3 bishop, again, just anchored in. No one's touching C2. Have tactical ideas on, the, you know, against G6. And maybe we, yeah, maybe G4, F5. You never know. Got to look at F5 as a sack too. But this is a great example. Look at that build up. Get your king out of the way. Look at that. Hey, now the bishop occupies that D4 square. But no, it's, it's interesting. Here we go. This is what I was talking about. So at this moment, he's like, look, I really like that bishop. So he just gives it up. And now we have all our advantages. We have opposite-color bishops, which helps us to attack in the middle game. Drawish in the end game, but keep in mind, do you guys know about that? How opposite-color bishops generally lead to attacks in the middle game? Have you heard that one? No, I never heard Because you can attack. So if you think about it, you, you can attack squares that it's hard for them to defend. Whereas in an end game, well, you could defend squares, right? No, basically it's for blockading purposes, right? So one bishop can hold off like two or three pawns technically and use the bishop and the king uh, to, to cover, uh, you know, to blockade a pawn, like their extra pawn. That's not going anywhere. So like if you trade down just one or even one or two pawns, like there are so many examples where there are draws. And also the bishops, well, the way you might beat it is if you have pawns on both sides and the bishop gets overloaded, right? You can imagine that. But um, yeah, but if they're next to each other, if you get your king and bishop nearby, like just pure king and bishop endgame, you just blockade the dark squares. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. But right now we're attacking white square. Like, let's say there's an attack by black against like H2 or coming on the, yeah, I actually saw a game recently where someone's like, like, oh crap, now they have bishop B6 and he's coming into G1 and there's nothing to do about it. I don't think, I don't think it was one of your games, but saw it like a few months ago. But yeah, and then suddenly it was just, it was over. Uh, okay, so G4, playing for F5, C6. Now, when is he finally going to play it? Okay, look at that buildup. Oh wait, is he, he's kind of creating an Alakine's gun. It's not an open file, but it's on a file that he wants to open. And again, like you're going to, it looks like you're going to have to give up your e pawn. There's, no, I mean, again, like, because he has the dark square bishop, he has a lot of pressure. You can't, it's, it's hard. It's going to be hard to like not sack the e pawn, but obviously you're, you're doing so much more. But you keep, keep in mind the context though. Remember, like in the fish bind run game, how exposed the white king became? Well, here he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to repeat that. The white king is kind of exposed. When you start opening things up, that's when you might get counterattacked. So again, Leia, going back to timing, or several of you guys, right? Going back to timing, don't do it if it's going to lead to a counterattack because that goes exactly to this point of playing F5 and taking. That's the equivalent of Black going F6 and taking. And Black would want that to counterattack you. So if you think about it, if you do it at the wrong time, you're facilitating them. You're like doing the counterattack for them. Does that make sense? Yeah. And as you can imagine, when you play F5, you're weakening uh, E5. So again, and they come take, and then suddenly like the queen gets nearby. Uh-oh, right? You make a checkmate or have to like give up a rook or something. So yeah, but you can see right now you're it's really they can't reach you yet. So and you only do it when they can't really reach you or it's insignificant because your attack overwhelms you. So you got to calculate though. Okay, now he's like, never mind. I'm coming back. He's just happy with his queen and rook there. 
Okay. So then we have uh, H6. So he's, he's timing it the best way he can. Well, by the way, now you don't have to worry about the bishop taking. The bishop has zero moves currently. So he's all, he, he waits until everything's tied up. Now, are we ready yet? Or do we need to do any more, uh, any other preparatory moves or what? Calculate it now. Because I mean, we've, we've been shuffling around maneuvering for like 10 moves to prepare this. So are you ready yet? Or do you need one final maneuver? Or what do you think? I think you need one final maneuver. Okay, what is it then? If we, if we have to come up, if we could come up with something, we do it. Okay, Lynn, that goes to your point. Do we do it? Well, in terms of, because there's nothing better, literally that's what I think, uh, I said something else earlier to, as a, uh, to respond to your point, but now it's literally, because you know you, again, we know you want your break, but if you effectively have nothing better to make your break happen, then you just uh, be like, okay, I'm just going to do it. Obviously, ideal, you know, ideal, you would have a tactical justification or positional justification, like, like if they take the pawn, it clearly opens up more stuff against them, like opens up diagonals and lines, right? Um, yeah, just because they have the dark square bishop doesn't mean they have a monopoly on the dark squares, especially not now, right? So you can imagine you can occupy dark squares too because their bishop's not doing anything, right? So you have a lot going on. Now the question is, Len, do we have anything better? So look a little, scan the board. We've certainly prepared a lot. I mean, the rook's on h2, but it, you know, it kind of has to hold on. Now we do not want to play g5. Definitely not good. That would be very anti-positional, wouldn't it? Because again, that would be helping black shut things down. And you'd have to sack with f5. You'd have to justify that. The whole point is to be able to prepare f5. G5 takes goes away from that purpose. So, question is, guys, what do you think? Are you what's your vote? Are we ready? Or think about that. Or well, we since you said that, then I guess that you we're ready. <laughs> right, yeah, it kind of hints at it. Well, you still have to verify. Like, but we're at that point. But again, going back to your quote about if you have nothing better to do or 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 nothing uh, uh, nothing else that could be improved or that you just have to, in other words, you're kind of forced. Well, sometimes you're literally forced to do your counterplay because you're about to get mated. So like you have to like chuck a pawn at them or something to, to block, there's that chuck, right? To chuck the pawn at them to like clog things up or whatever. Uh, but in this case, no, you certainly don't. You're, you, you, the nice thing is here, we have the luxury of time here. Like you can play, I don't know, King G2 and go back again. Nothing happens probably. They, but then again, you might give them time. Like in this case, the forced element would be, look, if I don't do it now, Actually, they'll they're gonna make consolidating moves like king d king somewhere d7 or d8 bishop comes out rook comes out you know what I mean because now there's no more pressure on h7 so the rook once you move yeah king d7 bishop b7 rook uh, h c8 king can run over to b b8 or something you see what I mean so you have to be a little careful here give them three free moves and black uh, consolidates to a large degree and that takes away the sting of your breakthrough okay so we so if we do it what happens. Now we get to pure, you know, calculation slash uh, intuition to the extent that you can't calculate everything necessarily. So think about that. Well, let's see. Queen can't take. Wait, can she take the e pawn? She takes the e pawn. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be like probably the main line to look at. It's like, okay, what if I just lose my e pawn? So f five, queen takes e five. Is it justified? Yeah, I think so. Happens. Um, I think then you would, hmm, which one would you take? I think the G pawn maybe? Because you, yeah, you, you give them fewer choices. Well, I guess if you take the E pawn, then the queen could take covering F7 maybe. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if that even works for them, but at least, yeah, if you take the G pawn, well, you're about to take their F pawn, right? Mm -hmm. So what if F pawn takes? Well, if F pawn takes, then queen will probably just take the G pawn. I yeah. mean, I mean, so the line would be f5, uh, queen takes d5. Then if we take here and they take, again, if they take the h pawn, we'll just take f7 with check. Mm -hmm. That's devastating. So let's say they go king, pawn takes. So not letting us take with check, but they are still open. We're getting our open line, which obviously we've been working toward. So what happens? Uh, yeah, definitely check with the rook. Takes, takes. So then you see you see where we are on then? With f takes. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, rook, yeah, yeah, that looks tempting. Uh, very tempting. Rook f7 check. Okay, they have to play what? Not to not lose King material. Uh, they need to go where? King e8. Okay, I think we see a tactic then. I think we have a tactic. To oh, win material. Okay. So we have check, king e8. Well, if they don't do that, we win f8. So that's done. So you guys calculate the tactic. Rook f7, king e8. Not like a mate, I don't think, but look at that for a moment. Okay, so I'm a little confused. You say that, that, uh, 
pawn moves to f5, right? Uh -huh. And then who takes that one? Um, they just ignore you. They probably they could okay, take so they I think the, main, the main line is can they get away with winning your epon? Because that's our concern. And we don't want to lose it for nothing. Right? I mean, no matter what, like I said, there's some intrinsic justification that we don't even need to calculate in terms of opening lines. Like you can, oh. in other words, this could be an intuitive push, but especially because we know we've maximized our forces and our rook, I mean, our rook is not maximized on H2, but it's doing what it needs to do. If it moves away, they just take H6, which probably doesn't behoove us, right? So we go for F5. Uh, let's say that um, they take our pawn. We can look at both pawn takes too, but let's say that they take our uh, E pawn. We take G6 and F takes back to not lose their F pawn with check, right? So we have uh, this and this, and we have rook check, and we have king. And have rook check. Are, are you with us on that? You see this line? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, rook, so rook's on F7, king's on E8, queen's on E5, right? So do you have a way to keep striking at them? I'm actually seeing, I haven't calculated this yet, but I'm seeing two dangerous ideas. Maybe winning material, you probably can play for a mate. Well, if the rook, if the king is on e8, then the bishop could go over to b5. Nice, nice calculation. So we're calculating our file, nice, play. Yeah. our file play. We got rank play too on the seventh. We got we're winning the rook probably at least the exchange. But I'm thinking about another idea also. Oh yeah, that's bad because we when they guard it with the queen. Wait, how did they guard bishop queen here? There's our c5 square again. Then we go rook uh, c7. Game over. We're gonna win that rook because it's pinned right. And it's nice because it's guarded by our queen. Game huh. over. So, so they try to hold on to the bishop, and then they lose the rook. Uh, yeah. So we're winning material a lot. I was also wondering if, if you know, you probably thought about this. I mean, you probably thought about like a rook move mm -hmm. to prepare queen f7 check. That might be mating because they can't. Yeah, they've abandoned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got yeah. F, I think yeah. that's probably winning on the spot. But I we know. So I mean, too, you know yeah. it works. You know it works. Yeah. Enough. But that's that's yeah. just the cherry on top there. If, if rook at b7 works, I think it does. Of course, I was thinking does, also like yeah. the other rook yeah. to stack in there. That was another. Yeah, problem. yeah, yeah. Sure, if you have time. Yeah, but yeah, that's definitely. No, you don't. You don't even need. Oh, you can triple and hit a hit up. Yeah, eight. yeah. I was thinking that. But, but the nice thing is, yeah, the the, the, the rather the uh, diagonal play, but also the uh, seventh rank play. Of course, yeah, that's faster. If it works, we're going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But they're yeah. all good. I'm sure they're all winning. But yeah. Now yeah. suppose suppose he he, he um, at this point. After after all the after bishop after okay. rook b seven so rook so he goes to f five queen takes e e e five oh he actually took this way in the game but yeah let's look at this line yeah yeah and that was my question now, the, was, now again we don't want to close things this would just like blow everything right it's gonna blow right everything. right because I mean that the whole point is to open the f file like because just like with the line where we would play g five you probably blow your attacks you have to be careful I mean obviously you break you have to keep mobility. So we take here, we're looking at, I guess if you take here, no, 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 never mind. You can do that too. I think it probably doesn't make a huge difference. But the thing about this is they have to take back with the pawn here. They might have like rook takes or something and maybe maybe king can hide on. No, it really, I mean, I don't think it matters a ton, but we were looking at taking here just to kind of for, just give them fewer options. And they probably want to take with, with the uh, F pawn because otherwise they just lose it with check. But either way, you're coming in. They, if they go away, we just win the bishop. And I don't think they have, any, see, you see what he's done though? He's created such a solid position to prepare this. So there's no like queen check here, here. So black has zero like relevant counterplay, see? Right. That's winning. Yeah, like I said, oh wait, oh, I was thinking. Okay, fine, then the queen, I was thinking queen was somewhere else, Never mind. No, she wasn't here, she's here, but then they have this move. And then, uh, yeah, never mind that. You yeah, have, you just move the rook, rook over. Seven. But we have rook, rook yeah, yeah, yeah. B7. Yeah, yeah, we just got to do something. But that's that's definitely winning. I yes. I don't think they could do anything. No. They have bishop. Oh no, no, they have bishop b seven. They do have a defense, maybe. But then we can go like check. I mean, it's bad. No matter what's bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're winning. The, even winning the exchange is very strong. But still, we you want. Throw in a spite check or something. Oh um, no! With the bishop there. No, after the bishop. Right. No, but then they abandon the rook. Uh, maybe. Um, oh no, that rook no, no, this is no, this win. is winning on this. Oh yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> who's I, I hallucinate one more time? No, I saw it, but I mean, but it, but I forgot that you can't do that. We go here, okay? Yeah, and I was thinking like maybe, but the rook is pinned, so there's nothing, yeah, yeah, probably they don't, they would have to try this. It doesn't work, and, and, you know, they're tied up now, and yeah, then, yeah, I don't know, it's 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 very bad. No matter, oh, how about this idea? That looks strong, too. And then they have check. We don't want to give them unnecessary checks. I know this works because. You could do it if you want, because check, you come up. Oh, and they have another check. Yeah, we have to be careful about their checks. I think 
probably uh this looks very strong mm -hmm. oh no 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 that's stronger that's stronger see now this one works that's stronger yeah that's We're good. writing the fork then <laughs> but yeah that you're winning the rook there um so yeah that that loses so the only question then is what about uh because i meant i meant uh i was looking at this they'd have to come this way that's the only way they can hold the rook now the queen can't attack it yet. i mean it's just so overwhelming but even if they came that way david you just bring your rook all the way over and then you can bring down your queen and and, and he's checkmated bring well he still got the, oh, the yeah, yeah this one i'm looking at they only have one attempt Bye, Leah. Leah. i'll see you later bye so, Leah. uh we can't go here anymore so i think it's going to be no, here no. or here well the cool thing about no here's the thing they you th you're threatening is is there a mate threat actually no, not because you got the bishop sitting it's very there. Dangerous. What's that? You, you got the bishop sitting there. So. so so the idea is that the bishop blocks, we can definitely do that. And we win the rook again. Bye, Kushal. See Bye, Kushal. Nice, nice to meet you, you. Kushal. See you next time. Hopefully you come by. Come by uh, next week whenever you can. I know I know you're busy. We're on I Saturday. will, surely, surely. Great class. Bye. Good night. Okay, take care. I'll see you another time. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Yeah, it was fortuitous, I guess, with the timing. So whenever you're free. Okay. So bishop e7, check. Bishop blocks. Yeah, but then they, we still have that move. What was the only other line? Was it? No, but the question is whether we're really threatening, what, how big of a threat that is. We have to find out. I mean, you also have things like check and then swing here and then like mate this way. And so, I mean, the mate ideas. But I think it's just that their, their rook is really just, I mean, no matter what, we're going to do something there. So, um, yeah, no, but the question is then, does, yeah, what if they, if they go here, we can win the rook. What if they do something else? I mean, everything's bad. Let's say they move the king over to get off the pin. Um, I and think you bring your queen the, right there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no matter what. I mean, even again. Yeah, he, he's going to get, get the queen in now. a minute. <laughs> yeah, he can't do anything. And then what yeah, was the, got what great, we No, this we have the attack. No, he's lost. No matter. They're going to lose the rook. Yeah. So they do this. And if they do anything random, yeah, then we still go rook a6 at the least. We're winning a whole rook, so game over. And we're about to mate him. But anyway, um, what happened? Takes, takes. Okay, why not? He gets the g file. So, you know, a little, see, that's the thing. You When you do the break, there's got to be something, right? You just have to make sure that your, that your attack is stronger than their counterattack. You know when you open lines, they should be able to take something. They get something out of it. Like, you have to be a little bit careful now, right? You have to be able to, you have to like, you know, just don't abandon. For example, like queen, queen, queen e2, uh, queen e2, uh, rook g1, or queen g1 mate. Yeah. So, so you take, take. Interesting. He could, I guess he could go rook f7, but then he's like, just take this with tempo. And now we could just win with our h pawn ultimately. You know, see, there's many ways to wow. win. Okay, hey, what's he doing? Some, oh, he's hoping for like a perpetual, I guess, but he's just losing. So now obviously he's losing materially. Oh, okay, okay. But then he's like, okay, you want to win my rook. There's no winning it now. And oh, I guess bishop can take h6 or something. I don't know. Then he just stops everything. Queen check, uh, rook down. Queen check. So we don't actually get our queen, but everything is hanging. And we get a rook. That's good enough. And now, uh, yeah, we're just going to, like, we can just trade pieces if we want. I mean, yeah, bishop's hanging. He's just forcing, it looks like he's forcing a trade. Oh, that's nasty. He's coming in the other way. Is he going to resign yet? Yeah, he resigned. <laughs> so how would it finish? Yikes. Check, check, check mate. So some winding or weaving around the king. Uh, but yeah, obviously, I mean, come on, we're up a rook. Anytime we have, we just win our material and we keep attacking. So pretty nice, huh? That's a great game. I think this is a great example of patience in your break. The first one, we had our immediate C, C5 break. And that's the thing. Like every game's particular is, is you know, circumstantial. So you want to put this in your kind of repertoire in a way as part of your pat your patterns. So in terms of pattern recognition, that's how complex chess is. So your general pattern recognition here is make in the French, go for C5, C5 break, maybe F6. White should go for F4, F5 break, maybe the H pawn. But then you have to think about, hey, well, um, like in this game, we learned that the F5 break doesn't just happen, you know, and we learned about the idea of maybe letting them uh, take with a pawn on D4 and just ignoring it. So because generally white probably wants to hold on to the D4 pawn. 
This time he, he ignores it. A lot of times white will even like take on C5. There's lines where like they hang all their pawns, but they have tons of peace activity. So those are all different patterns, right? So it's just like the, the level of complexity increases, right? So yeah, so that's the thing. That's why chess is so hard. Like, and you don't have, to, the thing is like, you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, all these themes are here, but then you have to apply it every single game in, in a unique circumstance. Yes. Every, I mean, this, is never, this has never been done before, right? right. This has never been done in this way. Uh, and black, it's a, that's that's where it's beautiful because it's a clash of ideas. You're trying to do your thing. Your opponent's like, oh, they want to play. Uh, they want to play a five. I better come up with something good. And they're like, oh, I see what they're doing. I got to counter that. So it's just like an argument, and and you you're just um, bouncing, uh, kind of building off each other's ideas. And it's a dance in that way, right? Apart and you know, David, it is a dance. But when you're on the clock, you got to really be thinking quick, 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 quick. It's a <laughs> once, it, yeah, once yeah, you uh, calculate that break, you know. Yeah, and that's into no. I mean, I mean that can certainly be intuition. You don't have to calculate every line where you win the rook or something. Although that is pretty clear. It is pretty clear because the rook check forces you start looking at lines like that. You're like, oh yeah, this is good. So you don't necessarily have to see every line, but you know, like, okay, if they take with the h pawn, I take f7 with check. If they take with the pawn, I still get the rook check. They don't. They don't want to hang their bishop on f8, but then they hang the rook effectively with bishop e5. <laughs> they hang it de facto after the pin, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah that was very it's interesting. I, I, I like I like this pawn break lesson. Yes. Very, it's very very excited in, to see that. Yeah. Oh yeah, super important. I mean, this is. Uh, but did, what it shows you, know, you got to really know your stuff, you know, in order to be able to do those breaks and do like we just did in this game with this um, F five. Yeah, he really set that up. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, yeah. and the interesting thing is that he did it so late since he was so patient. It was late in the game. He only had a few pieces left. But you, hey, you could even do it in the end game. Like we're what if, is, yeah, uh, like what if you jump the gun? The game, what phase of the game would you consider uh, this? When you uh, this is probably heading towards the end game. Yeah, like middle, precisely. precisely. Middle towards end game. So yeah. Late, yeah, I'd consider a late middle game. Yeah, yeah. We're not, quite, we're not quite at the transitional phase yet. No. There's a lot of attacking going on. A lot of firepower. Kings are very nervous to come out. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, yeah, it would be where it would be a transitional phase. Well, he never got there because he's getting mated. But yeah, this would be kind of, you know, like something like this, when the material is coming down to a few pieces each, we're getting into an end game. But unfortunately, by then, it doesn't really matter because in the end game, we're up like two pieces or something, right? So then you don't really get into the end game. By the time it's like, oh, it's funny because it's moved 40. So that would generally be, generally be where you'd uh, get to uh, the new time control, like another half an hour or hour added. Or maybe they add like every 15 moves or something, but you get more time. So this is generally, you know, you're kind of approaching an end game. Sometimes a lot of times around move 40, but then he makes one more move. He's like, okay, I, this is just after the time control. I, I come back from my break, you know, because I have more time. I can take a break now. And, you know, it may have been in time pressure. And I'm like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> so I have to resign, right? You evaluate because I'll, I'll often take a long time if I have a, a sudden death. Uh, you know, because I'll be in time pressure. Like, okay, let me take a break, get some water. Then I come back. I'm like, let me study this for 10 minutes because I want to make sure I play the end game. Not if it's like pure tactics like this, but I want to make sure I get the end game right because everything else right. is going to flow from that. So I'd rather be in time pressure and have a good position. But, you know, especially with that 30 second increment, it gives you that luxury to time pressure. In other words, is not as bad anymore with the common 30 second increment, right? If you have a five second delay, time pressure matters a lot more, right? It, it, you value you value it a lot more than if you say, oh, I could be in time pressure. I to, it's a very calm blitz game, right? I'm down to five seconds, but I, I just got 30 seconds on my clock, right? If you <laughs> if you average it out, it's probably more like a 15 minute game or something like that. So anyway, um, yeah, there's that game, but that's a that's a very complicated game. But we broke it down, so we saw. I mean, we yeah, it's just. But if you if you take away nothing else, it's the F5 break and the preparation for it. Yeah, what if he didn't prepare? Like, what if he did it too soon? Like, that would just, like, then he'd just get crushed, right? Like, if he, like, just lost his patience and, like, did it, like, now. Like, let's say then, it, well, then, then it would resemble the other game, right? Uh -huh. then, okay. then you'd have, an, pretty much, you'd have, because you'd have an example of the, the G-pawn falling or something. Or right, maybe, right, you'd, okay. You'd probably lose your E-pawn. E-pawn, so like, yeah. Very, very mm -hmm. Right? And, and Black got the play on the C-file. Yeah, okay. it's different. It's different, but the themes are the same. 
over yeah, I see that epon. Yeah, I see like yeah, yeah. overextension, exploitation of that okay. losing material, uh, getting on diagonals and stuff. It's just different, but it doesn't matter. You the difference is in terms of like, oh, is it a knight or a bishop that's invading this time? That's just circumstantial, right? That's the thing. Right. The theory is still pretty similar in terms of going one, going for your breaks, and two, stopping or minimizing your opponent's breaks. Now, this happens a lot, like in a, a Catalan, for example where your opponent's hoping to get C, if you have white, your opponent wants to get a C5 break, like a queen's gambit, right? They want to play C5 eventually. But if you have a Catalan where you like have a half open C file, you try to stop the C5 break. If you stop that, black has basically no play and they're going to get desperate or they're just going to sit around passively and that, and obviously a passive defense pretty much fails. So then you get to do whatever you want and you slowly prepare your king side or central break mm -hmm. with E5 or something or D5. So that's what you want because you, you want a one-sided position. So that's great. When you have deep understanding of closed positions, you can make it one-sided, right? Because you know what yeah. they, not even what they want to do, what's possible for them. It's pretty obvious, right? Uh, which break they should go for. And then you just stop it. Or you say, you're going to do it, but with minimal impact, or it's going to hurt you to do it. Like like white do, getting impatient. So it took Anand, took a very strong play Anand to make it actually work. But I love some of these ideas. So again, we know our main concepts, but you take away new patterns here. Like for example, the, the power of the knight on A4 um what else the ability to hang this to have a problem on c2 you know which could it could become a problem tied we might get tied to it and then to find a creative way to avoid it which is like ignore it uh we have new what other ideas well we utilize the bishop pair pretty well then we have ideas of really building on the f file so essentially we really see this as like an eruption on the f file which really again releasing of the kind of potential energy in your position right it becomes kinetic f5 very kinetic right so you see how it goes from slow to fast, slow play. Basically. And and that D3 bishop. Yeah, yeah. It, yep. uh, it became really strong. Wait, was there a moment where Black could have, I thought there was a moment where Black could have taken it or something, no? No, I guess not. I, I, there's a game where he like leaves the bishop on D3 and even allows Black to take, but it wouldn't matter. No, I, I guess not in this game. I think it's a similar, maybe in another or non game. No, no, that, oh, oh, no, he came here. So no, there's, there's a line maybe where you consider him taking, but he's like, nah. I like my good bishop. This mm -hmm. is an example. No, the bishop on d4 is not terrible. I mean, again, like that would have been a, that would have consolidated e5. So that would have helped him play f5, actually. And maybe he had tactics like trade, trade e6 tactics against the other bishop, but at least it minimizes, it counterbalances their bishop's pressure. There's a lot of complexity there, but you have themes of blockading the d pawn with the piece, not a pawn. You have the strength of that bishop anchored in by the c pawn, uh, mutually defending each other, right? Then you have the f file buildup, and then you have the intuitive, maybe intuitive breakthrough. But by that point, and we talked about opposite value bishops as attackers, and we have the value of our H pawn, not just as a breakthrough, but as a passed pawn that could just be winning all, all on its own. I mean, a lot of times you could be castled king side and they could be queen side, and yet you could win on the king side with your passed H pawn, right? Because you have the rooks and everything nearby. So just because there's a, a, a open G file doesn't matter that much sometimes, even if you're the one opening lines on your own side, ironically, right? Yeah, white killed me in a Sicilian that way. <laughs> yeah, they can play on the right. Or for, for example, um, how would that work out? So in a Sicilian, white's castled uh, queen side and then yeah. black throws everything at them there. Yep. And then white can play a4, lock it down and like pick off your pawns or like invade on b5. Similarly, black hopes for that too. h4, h5, soldier's variation of the dragon. White would need to go g4 basically to open up lines, but then black gets some pawns. They probably uh, win more material. Like maybe white needs to cough up an exchange. So they say, okay, I hold on, and then I'm going to beat you on the king side. Maybe black sacks, in, or maybe white gives up some pawns, then black sacks the exchange, like for the c3 knight. And then suddenly you're, you're, you trade into an end game, and then black is, well, white has the double c pawns, isolated a pawns, a bad mm -hmm. structure, and black has like double con uh, uh, connected past pawns on the king side, and black just wins. Yeah. So yeah, so, so it, it's, it's all about, so a lot of the lessons here, you have your basic patterns. But it is circumstantial, and that's where chess is hard. <laughs> the chess is not just, oh, I learned my theory, you know? Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, um, everybody Can you put would... this link in the um, chat, please, by the way? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to have to go, David, because uh, uh, it's getting ready to rain over here, and I have an errand I need to run. Oh, yeah, definitely. All right, Lynn. Well, great comments. Okay. Thanks for coming, guys. It's always good to see you, Lynn. All right, right. Mm -hmm. it's Chess and 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 um, Richard and John and everybody else who's on. Have a great weekend. Uh, you too. And okay, Lynn, bye think bye. about it. I think about think competing. Like, I know you're going to do well. Think about oh, it. Oh, I am. I am. I am. It's just I, I, it, I, I, got, I got you. I got you on the top of my ear, David. <laughs> well, well um, yeah. Just it's about timing. Build up. Get your build up, but you can't wait forever.
Well, this game right here just showed me how, you know, I'm doing what this game has done. I'm building up my pieces, building up my repertoire, building up my confidence. I'm building it all up. And then I'm going to strike. And then when you strike, <laughs> it, right, you, you can't wait. It's like there's an essay called Split at the Root. I think Adrian Rich, I really like the quote, Split at the Root. And there's a, if you guys check it out, it's called Split at the Root. And uh, yeah, it's it just talks about we can't wait until it's perfect. In this case, it probably was perfect, but sometimes you just play that F5 intuitively. So that's the thing. That's what I'm talking about. You reach that crux, there's crux here. You reach that, uh, that, that juncture. Use your intuition too. That's what I'd say. Right. Do it, right. Do what's best All right. I'm just suggesting. Thanks very much, David. All right. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah. Um, and while we're at it, well, I mean, uh, we have, let's see. Well, we had, we looked at the French quite a bit. Her, let's say, let's see, to finish the French, why don't we just do the F6 break? Because we've talked about the C5 break, F4. Mm -hmm. I think F6 is very important. And then, uh, yeah, then we can, well, there's more, but you can supplement that with your own study because uh, I sent you the link. But definitely next time we could just do King's Indian. Yeah, that sounds another like a good one plan. on the hybrid warfare stuff. Uh, but yeah, let's check that out. Yeah, then I'll probably have to go a little earlier today anyway. So we'll just uh, okay. we'll just do this one then. All right. So this is a uh, Korchnoi versus some, um, you know, like a twenty three hundred or twenty four. I think a twenty four. I love Korchnoi. I like his style. Oh, yeah, <laughs> He's just cool. such a solid dude. Oh yeah, for sure. Let me see this game. Does it? Oh, it doesn't show the. It doesn't have the game in the database. Huh? Nope, it does not. It just has two 2300s playing this position. It's actually very interesting because not only does, does he, so we, he does the F5, F6 break rather, but he doesn't do the C5 break. Now, normally I would say you probably do C5 first anyway, and then F6. Usually that's how it goes. Very typical for, for a French. But here's the thing. It, he didn't, okay, he advanced it on the next move, right? Advanced French. Now black goes about it. Is this different. a winnower? What what's going on? This is a winnower, but usually black oh. play. The main move is by far C five, and this is obviously not the exhaustive database, not comprehensive. Okay. Fifteen thousand games. Obviously, it's been well. Mm -hmm. If you look at the entire Lee chess, we see one mil one point eight million games. <laughs> um, I don't think I. Oh, I had it one time. Oh, because my student was practicing it, so we did a sample game, and uh, he drew me. So not bad. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, you can look at your own games in it. You can look at GM game or master games and can filter those. And you can look at Lee chess. And again, you can filter by ratings. So you could be like, oh, who's played it uh, and not pull it. So you might be like, how about above 2000 uh, only like. Oh, that's OPC. super cool. I didn't know about the ratings. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'll show you the difference. Let's see. Let's only do over 2000 and let's only do, okay, how about rapid and above? So we know we're going to have pretty high. What is this? Yeah. So I have pretty high quality games. Or you could just do correspondence when they'd be pretty good at theory there. But now, um, how many do we have? What's uh, one, 100,000. <laughs> and those are 100,000, probably uh, pretty high quality games to look at. And we see that C5 is by far the main move. Although interestingly, 97 is the second most common move. Uh, scores 1% less for, we trade a percentage point, right? 1% less for white, one more for black. So pretty similar. But 97 is quite interesting because you're deferring your break. We can certainly do it if we want. But it's like atypical. Now, do they even, I don't know about that. Uh, it's interesting. Well, they're like, okay, I'm going to trade off your good bishop for the bad bishop on D2, generally speaking. But now, well, because the knight's here, we don't want to play C5. We don't want to see knight D6 check, right? That would be a weakness if we push. Oh, knight. that's happened to me. <laughs> that would be a bad, pretty yeah, bad. Found, It'll yeah. take us, we'll have to find a way to trade it off. But oh, it's horrible. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna, well, usually what happens is the knight checks, then they have this and you get crushed. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So we'll go a six, like back five. Okay. Uh, well, the idea now is it's gone back, but now we can play bishop a six, and he comes back again. It's like doesn't matter. Well, now it's hanging, but he doesn't. Obviously, he still doesn't play c six, and he doesn't give up his. Oh wait, I was going to say good bishop. <laughs> no, this has become a pretty good bishop now. Yeah. No, in other words, he's not going to give it up to the extent that uh, where where White's going to have a nice bishop, uncontested. Nice c six, bishop d three. H6, C3, castles. This should be one. Uh, that old plan. There that old it is. Trick. There it is. <laughs> okay, there you go. So basically, he just opted for F6 instead of C5. And yeah, I mean, it looks weakening. It is weakening. Does he like he weakens the diagonal a bit? You know, uh, G6. This is all like targets, right? Potential targets if you can reach it. Uh, the other interesting thing about it is if he goes for the the mating attack. 
we have the option of bypass, but, yeah, you, can't, yeah. but you can't do it now. Like you, if you're on F7, you can't do it because you take on Ambassant and that's right. bad. But you have, now you can actually do it. Like, and even if he, uh, let's say this happened, I don't know, is that fine? But let's just say a sample line. I don't know, you might have to actually. No, you could actually, you know what? You're not losing right now, I think. Cause check, they don't have Bishop G6 cause knight covers. I mean, I don't like it, but oh, probably a lot of people would play F5 here. But the point is, you know, F4. Yep. No, you know what? Now you probably can take it. And then you, because, because you want to take, we, again, you don't have to, because you just take back with the knight and your knight's well placed again. So we see similar themes again, right? F file stuff, G4. Mm -hmm. like, again, let's go back to the Zarabuck, or how you pronounce it, the Zarabuck game. Um, yeah, but I think you can get away with This is interesting. It's cutthroat, right? It's cutthroat chess. No, it doesn't matter though. I don't think it matters. But this is different because you're gaining something from this transaction, I guess, right? So the knight's hanging. Okay, that is annoying, actually. Yeah, well, he comes in and then... That is kind of scary. No, the problem here is that you're going to lose the G-pot if you run. But then again, uh, maybe you can get away with it. But uh, you, you, like I said, it's very it's a cutthroat line. Um, but I mean, hey, if you go here and then they bother you with this knight. Uh, wait, are you are you winning here? <laughs> no, no, I just hallucinated it again. Okay, takes, check. It's a little tired. No, this doesn't do anything. Actually, yeah, it just petered it out. <laughs> oh, no, no, yeah, you can't go here. You can go here. Yeah, you can probably go here. It's a little, again, it looks scary, but I don't think it is. And keep in mind, you can like go here and just castle by hand easily. Yeah, and he can't get his rooks in. It time. feels like a dragon on the other side of the board. <laughs> you know, like yeah, yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> instead of G4, it's B4, right? Anyway, uh, takes, he does take, but I do think, well, I'm curious. Let's just check the computer what it thinks, if it likes F5 or what, or maybe it doesn't think you need to do it. Now it says F5 equality, basically. Interesting. Like if, not, if anything, it likes black, it's had. It would have, I mean, you'd probably want to give it like half an hour to, to figure out ideas. But this is a very, very uh, slow strategic game. Um, but yeah, basically black's fine. It's just going to be like maneuvering. But black has effectively carried out the F6 slash F5, F6 break, bypass it, shuts down a lot of white's play. And then he can, hey, ultimately he can play C5. Or maybe he'll decide to take the knight and try to outplay the bishop, right? But we have grammar here. Oh, I think that's Richard. Yeah, he came in <laughs> to watch the, to look at the uh, study. That's yours, right, Richard? Grammar, if I recall. So we have takes, takes. Queen c2. Oh, there it is. But now we have knight g6. And again, just keep in mind, like, they can't sack their knight to open it up. That's different, right? It's not a mate. So you, if they go knight, if they, maybe h4, h5. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even then, like, you always have knight f8. You could transition to f8. And the car, the Karpov would have. So Karpov, anytime he, he plays F3, he's pretty much going bishop F3, bishop E3 to F2. If he plays, if there's an attack on H7, he's probably going not F8 because he's going to make sure his opponent has nothing on his king, right? Very solid. So, uh, but yeah, it's a typical maneuver, obviously. But you don't need to do it. I mean, again, worst comes to worst. Let's say you end up on F4 or something. Then they check. You just play king F7. There's no follow-up because you have a rook and a knight, two covering uh, this square. You can bring in your knight. So you're fine. You're really fine. You have to realize that. So well, largely because of the break. Oh, here's the other thing I didn't mention. I forgot to mention that you got rid of the e pawn. So, so again, you yeah, technically weakened your e pawn, but you got rid of their e pawn, which is which is that the the wedge in your position. Yeah. I mean, you wedge on f6, maybe basically it's a wedge, kind of cuts the board in half. You got rid of it. And now, hey, we would love to play e5. If you get e5, and again, I've had I have cool some cool lines I've tried where Carlson has done it. And I've tried it where your bishop in a Karakon wraps around to c7. And then you get e5. So you've never played, uh, you only have c6. You haven't played c5. So you have a pawn chain here. Your bishop wraps around. You do the f6 thing. And then, and then you just control. And I, I have a cool win like that. So I have to find it. It was really fun against like pretty strong, solid master. And it just took over. You know, I just came in. It was like done once I played e5. Just attacked this king. So it's pretty cool. It just shows how you can get, well, they call that a flash attack. Because you don't expect it. All of a sudden you play f6. Boom, it's flash attack. So it's usually more peace play, but we did get our break. The break was a central one to get rid of. So three purposes, sort of, at least three. One, you get rid of the e pawn, or the main thing, you open up the rook, right? You open up your rook to attack. Two, you get rid of their e pawn, which I know there's like sub purposes too. So you, get, you bring your rook, let's say this, you bring your rook to f6 to attack and defend. It defend, like, for example, knight g6 is possible, and you get rid of the e pawn, which creates like attacking chances and squeezes you, right? Uh, and two, you're, you're able to play e5 now because the pawn's gone. Well, at least, okay, there's a few purposes at once, right? But yeah, you do a lot of things. You get rid of their strong pawn, you bring out your rook, help your attack. 
um, getting your e5 break if you want. Yeah, so it does multiple things. And if you do have a bishop, then your bishop can go to d6 or c7, and it can hit that diagonal suddenly. So yeah, it's very good stuff. So e takes f6, rook takes, and again, you can see the light squares are weak. That's your con. That's what you're giving, right? That's your right. compliment. So it's complicated too. Queen c2, knight g6. But again, it's sort of necessitated because if you hadn't done it, you get in trouble and you've just chosen to do it instead of the other one. Oh, you have the computer there. Minus, again, it was around minus one, right? 9.9, whatever. But anyway, um, but yeah, you, you can see that, um, let's bring it here. You can see that it loves black. I love black's position. And, and now that you've done all this, you can probably play uh, e5 anytime you want. You may not need to. You might go like knight. I think, did he do that? He might've gone here. Yeah, I think he did that. You can, I mean, you want to mobilize everything. So you can go here maybe, and then go here, maybe sack the exchange, come around this way, take this <laughs> too much, too wow. much. And you can go queen f7 or e7. Uh, so you can, you can then get in a diagonal later. So let's say you're like on e7. And then when you move the rook, you can, whether you sack or f4 or something. Yeah, I kind of like, like sacking, right? It's like sacking on c3 when they castle queen side because you would double their pawns and you could bring your queen in and your knight in right yeah i see that there's just like nothing there like this like i keep looking at like some kind of oh my god i have knight g4 or knight h4 oh no but no, no there's nothing there you're right yeah yeah so you have to realize that but it'd be easy to make a misevaluation there to misevaluate it mm -hmm. and say oh i gotta be <laughs> careful because white has an attack now yes if the pawn were on e5 then you always got to worry about like if the pawn's on h7 that's where white's going for like classic bishop sacrifice you know greek gift on h7 mm -hmm. or just build up like this and provoke g6 and weaken your dark squares and hit you with like f4 f5 or h4 h5 so yeah, white yeah. has a it's a field day right and you're trying like yeah you have the c file and stuff but if they hit you first oh it does take white time that's the thing about these counterattacks. it does take white time so anyway rookie one bishop takes pawn takes queen d3 and there's your side oh you were right but this just shows you know the idea though is now it's just tactics but the idea, though, is that, you know, you've got your break in, you got your activity. And oh, look at that. There it is. He does it. But he knows, oh. he, but he knows that, look, yes. He so he's giving up an exchange, damaging the structure, and he's letting this weird thing happen. Uh, but then again, if you have King H, you can't take as Rook G8 wins the queen. So how does it finish? OK, that's a freebie. You want to checkmate on H2, right? Wow. So, so ultimately, our queen gets there. But you can see it's, it's very strong. So he's, he's willing to just give, well, now he's attacking there. Okay, so he's like, fine, I'll just Whoa. take. <laughs> then I think it, he falls for some tactic. What is going on? Wait, what is this? He's hoping it's going to do something. I don't think it does anything. What's oh, that? interesting. No, no, he's going to he's gonna get the G-pawn now. See? But uh -huh. Black is oh, a, oh, oh, okay, okay. He was okay. desperate, though, so he, he gave up a knight uh, hoping for a, a, a counterattack. But again, we got to be cutthroat here. We want that piece. We're going to take the piece if we can. So essentially, it's one of those situations like um, you provoke someone to give up their bishop for your H pawn or something. Like, I want your piece and I'm going to hang on. Here, you provoke them to give up the knight. Yeah, for the G pawn effectively. But they have an exposed king also. And hey, if you know you're going to hold on here, it's okay. Are you holding on? Just moving that away. You want knight F5. Yeah, you're holding on. Yep, and that's like our first, the first game you showed Nikki. Wow. Remember Nikki, the first game you leave, you just play King D8 or something, right? You take that piece. Wow. King, remember the King D8 idea? Mm -hmm. And you just do it. You're, you're fearless because you win the piece. Same same concept, different circles. Oh yeah, oh, God, you have a good memory. Wow. Yep. And that was the first game you showed. Yeah, I remember that. Yes. Was very no, I I learned something from that too. I mean, because it just a new. I mean, I, yeah, I knew maybe I knew about the pattern. And I know you want to be cutthroat and uncompromising, but the way in which it occurred in your game was different. The way in which it occurs here. So now you guys, you, you, maybe you, some of you guys weren't thinking about letting them check you, right? And maybe you, would, maybe you wouldn't have thought of letting them take, take yeah, on. Yeah, I dismissed that immediately. Like, oh, no, I'm right. not getting into that. But you got to look, you got to like, yes. like you're saying, like you yeah, got to kind of. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Yeah, I was just saying like, like you say, like, you know, you definitely want to consider it. Like, don't just dismiss it because it's, you know, it looks scary. Mm -hmm. yeah and then, and then it becomes a candidate move otherwise it doesn't become a candidate move right it should be right. part of your search and if it's not a candidate move you're not it's not going to be a move it's not going to happen you're going to miss your chance uh but yeah and sometimes they're going to be cutthroat situations but that's where you, you and that's where people learn a lot from the computer 
or Bobby Fischer, because <laughs> you know that they make these moves like, wait, what are they doing? It's like, it looks <laughs> so weird. I wouldn't have considered it. Well, you that's like brilliant moves in general. Like br yeah. a brilliant move usually looks like a blunder and that's why it's brilliant because it's hard to find. Well, it's either just like a gem that's really hard to find and there's nothing really crazy about it. But a lot of times it's so hard to find it's like, wait, yeah, I mean, classic brilliant example is those queen sacrifice because you wouldn't think of sacrificing your queen. Right. Or you have to prove that it works in some amazing way or it involves, but it doesn't have to be a sacrifice, but those are glorious. They tend to win brilliancy prizes. Yeah. We don't really do much anymore, but historically they've been a lot of brilliancy prizes in tournaments. But it might not, yeah, it could be a piece. Usually it's some sacrifice because it's cool, but it doesn't have to be because it'd be like brilliant, like wonderful play, you know, deep calculation, wonderful technique, stuff like that. So King G2, and then he resigns. E5 actually makes, hey, there you go. There you go. Let's finish the yeah, day. Yeah, you said it too. I thought that finish one. it with a pawn break, right? Well, well, why does he do it? Well, it's kind of weird. Okay, Leia's not here, but this this goes to, speaks to her point of freeing your position. Because, hey, that E6 pawn, it was, theoretically, like I said, it's a weak pawn. Um, but it did, he just, it didn't actually affect them, right? It actually helped probably guard the E file. It's kind of like in a Sicilian, like Sveshnikov, we have the D6 weak, quote, weak pawn, but that pawn is still a central pawn along with your E pawn and black, white only has one, black has two. And that kind of stabilizes the position if you don't lose it. So here it would guard the E file, right? For the king to run in many cases. It never got taken. He gives it away, but it frees the queen and probably, uh, yeah, they'd probably just go here. Oh, oh, yeah, I was going to yeah, say, like, what is he going to do next? Gonna I was around. trying to figure that okay. out. Like, what is he? Yeah, okay. So yeah, yeah, I'd freeze, I'd freeze the queen. And then, uh, it, it, which actually, well, if you think about it, the H-pawn was hanging. So it actually guards your H-pawn. E-pawn's oh, hanging okay. in many cases. And rook G1 just trades. If you go rook, actually, if you go rook G8, they kind of have to trade everything in many cases. But I mean, if you get, if you get queen and knight against queen, I mean, that's just, a, that's a winning position. You just have to knock it, you know. Just don't let them perpetual you. But yeah, you can walk your king c8 to b7. As long as you cover c6, they have no checks. So just we wow. don't calculate, but you envision scenarios. I want my king on b7. I want to have queen. Nine. Or, you know, or I just have stabilized enough to the extent that maybe they maybe they keep the rook. Actually, you might want rook f7 too. But maybe they keep the rook, but then you like go queen f5. But they moved away from the knight, right? You got to move away from, you can't double yet. You go like queen f5 and hit f2 or something like that. But probably just unleash your knight soon enough and queen knight. Maybe rooks, but queen knight versus queen, unleash the knight game over. Just don't let them get a perpetual. But yeah, I, I, I said that at the end. I really like that. I'm like, a final, yeah, final break makes for a fitting addition to the collection. So you get to this game at least. But yeah, yeah that's it's, a nice it's, final break. Because that's quite, the thing. Like, What's that? I don't know if I would have, like, yeah, obviously I wouldn't have come up with that. I think like once that, once you got to there, I try to find some way to, hmm. Yeah, consolidate. I don't know if I come up with e5, that would be hard. I would want to try to yeah. do some trade or something. And that's why he's Korchnoi, because he comes yeah. up. With yeah. But now that's we learn cool. from it. It's, but it's all about peace activity, right? You free, yeah, you get your break. Kind of you, a4, you're free, you're, I don't know. I don't know what I, I don't know. Like, uh, But the default should be to maximize your forces and minimize yeah. them. Yeah, that, okay. This achieves the, the objective. You, you, your queen is begging to be let out. You let her sure out. It does, yes. And, and then you also, you don't lose your H pawn. It happens to, I mean, I guess if they take your H pawn, then what? If they take your H pawn, you don't have nine of five. I mean, at the very least, you can still trade with rook g8. But no, if they take the H pawn, no, then they've taken the pressure off e7. Then you could come out there with queen f5. Yeah, so, I was thinking that. Yeah, yeah. If they yeah, take the H pawn, then queen much. it. Queen, queen f5 you'd like to five. fork them nine of five and you hang your queen on d7 and they have like a queen check that, that, that doesn't work and now she's out yeah she's out and about that would be cool yeah but you go to e6 you can also come to f5 soon no, no you can't go queen f5 now though because you still have right, to right. night but then yeah you no matter what though you're trading so no matter what you get the with three four five you're actually not even down no you're down currently one pawn because you because of that move but yeah it's a pawn so again going back to that it's a pawn break it loses a pawn temporarily but it doesn't matter because right. pieces you trade into a winning on game but you really don't need it so let's see I'm, I'm curious what does the computer say just to get a sense well <laughs> it's giving uh yeah it's a, see i think it's up a piece but it says minus seven okay let's say they what were they going to do do they even have any they have nothing to do okay let's say the best the quote best move it just wants to take the pawn it wants to trade queens which is obviously completely lost uh well they don't have anything to do yeah, by all means, please trade queens. <laughs> okay, let's just say the king. Let's give him a king move. Oh, he's looking at king move. Okay, there we go. Okay. That makes more sense. Still wants to take. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't have to go out of your way to trade rooks yet. They can't do anything. They can't go to g8, nothing. 
and they have no checks. Okay, fine, we give them this one. Yeah, but again, they have nothing at all to do. So you just keep improving, you sneak in there, hmm. creeping your way in. And, and yeah, you know, the knight's actually a great defender. So you kind of just pretend like you're not even up a knight yet. Let's just use these two against these two. But the knight allows it, it has the defensive benefit right now. That's a good way to look at it. Has the defensive benefit, but obviously it's going to spring forth when it wants to. <laughs> you know, it's going to yeah. come in very <laughs> soon, right? So yeah, it's a great, I mean, every one of these games, I mean, you're looking at champions, right? We're looking at a strong GM and then we're looking at uh, two, um, well, a guy who was almost a world champion. They arguably should have been by a lot, but I think against Karpov. And then you have Anna, who was a multi-time world champion. But you just see the subtlety of their play, uncompromising play. So there's good lessons to take away. Don't just play solidly, right? Play, yeah. play very purposefully, uncompromising play. Uh, get, do that exchange stack. Get your activity. You played it. Look at those bold moves he made. He didn't. He yeah, did that's. He never played it. He never played C5. He went against the grain there. It's what? Yeah, I was just thinking like that rook sack that again like goes back ties into your lesson from last week with the positional, you know the you know that's the common theme like with sacking the rook, break open. Yeah, the oh, yeah. Uh huh. It's a positional. Well, it became tactical, but it's also a positional sack. Now, you didn't like make them. You didn't make them from it, but you compromised their king position. Oh, and by the way, you took away not you took it's positional too because you took away uh, the knight from e five which is a problem. Of course, the E6 square is mm -hmm. E6 is weak, E5 is weak. So that way you got to play E5 later. You got to sack a C pawn effectively. You got to do another sack, which arguably, yeah, it's a positional sack too to play E5. But uh, yeah, so uncompromising play, sack. Very cool. And again, we, we eliminate variables here. Get rid of their knight because our bishop wasn't doing anything anyway. Now we have better minor pieces. We have, a, we have a minor piece that he doesn't have. We have two again. We have two minor pieces. We want that because <laughs> they're doing more than the rook. And then our knights, the bishop is actually rendered kind of moot. Then he has basically then they're lost. Well, queen d6 is a crushing attack. They can't stop it actually. They can't even. You're, this is hanging. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go queen d3. Just take the rook. So the only thing is to play rook g1 to come over, and then obviously you're not gonna um, go queen d6 now because this is hanging. Hmm. No. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. That you don't need that. We probably could, <laughs> but yeah. Now, now we're just up a piece. And we know it's going to work because we know we can allow this ugly look. It's ugly look again, ugly looking moves. Oh no, they get yeah, stuck. scary. But, but you know, you look objectively. You have to look objectively at it. You have to remember, as you said, Nikki. Just consider the candidate moves. And don't panic. <laughs> yeah, keep your cool. Just look at it objectively, like a computer, I guess. Yeah. But no, just look at it. Just but yes. Study the lines. Just study the lines, and and then you. Yeah, emotions might come into play too in terms of like your passion, your drive. You know, these things are important too. And avoid, well, ideally avoiding fear, to, to, well, except to the extent that like you don't want to walk into too much danger. But the fear would at least, a little bit of fear would at least indicate that you should be careful about like queen h7 because in some cases that does something, right? right. So you can stand that you're, you're prudence, more like prudence, but caution. Yeah, so does that make sense to you guys? Any questions? No, that was that was a fantastic class. Um, I appreciate it. I also wanted to tell you um, after your after your video was over. Okay, yeah, I'll just pause. I'll stop that. Yeah, great job, guys. Um, and we can continue. Yeah, I'll, well, we had two parts to positional chess. Now let's have at least two parts to this because they're such important topics. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the King's Indium one too. That's going to be good. Cool.